this season. Uh, it, 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 it paid off, and in, in, as we're kind of hearing, it paid off in more than just the gold medal, uh, but in, in the memories and the friendships and just in the great camaraderie that everybody has. So thank you so much for letting us just experience that incredible moments alongside with you guys. Thank you. Just to echo what David said, um, thank you for everything you've done. Uh, it's been an amazing run. Uh, it just shows everybody what we all can do when we come together and we can include others and, and really work together as a team. Um, and really, regardless of your ability, your skill, as long as we work together, uh, partner together, include others, we can you know, make amazing things. And your gold medal is a testament to that. So, so thank you. It's like congratulations to all of you on this amazing accomplishment. Yeah, yeah, thank you. The, uh, your, all of you guys, your spirit, your hard work, um, so yeah, your friendship and robbery just exemplifies everything that's just amazing about Franklin. And yeah, we're, you know, our community is forever gold medalist because of you guys. So thank you. <laughs> I sat here a couple of weeks ago, right? And I told you, you know, it's not about winning. It's about the journey, right? Remember that? And it is, that's still very true. And sometimes in life you go through and you put all your effort into it and you lose and you fail and you make mistakes and you get set back. But sometimes when you really put all your effort in, you win. And we're just so proud, it feels really good. And I love to see you wearing those medals. I can see you out in the parking lot. And I was like, I just hope you wear those all the time. That's a really special thing. It's great. Thank you so much. Congratulations. We're very proud of you guys. And this, uh, an amazing achievement. I'm still a newbie, so I don't know how everything in town works, but I think there should be a sign coming off the exit that says we were gold medal winners. <laughs> Council, did you hear that? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hearn, for bringing them here. It's much, it's much more exciting to see them here than just hear about it in a couple of sentences. So thanks for coming out on, on this night tonight. I know you have a lot of other things you could be doing. Much appreciated. And I'd also like to point out we have some family members too in the audience too and want to thank them. And uh, so congratulations to all. And I'll continue reluctantly with the rest of my superintendent's report. Um, in lieu of the high school students, I did put together some, uh, some updates related to the high school as well as some student events uh, across the district. Um, since our last meeting, we had uh, graduation and all of the senior week events, uh, which were fantastic. It was really wonderful to see uh, senior week happen in a, like back to the routine traditions that we've done in the past. And I especially want to thank the uh, volunteers who participated in the all night party, uh, the night of graduation, which is a huge endeavor, and it takes a lot of work on the part of our community members. Um, but it was an amazing graduation and congratulations to our graduates. Um, we are in the final weeks of school, and this is just a reminder that our last day of school is a half day for students next Wednesday, the 22nd. And uh, final exams, as I noted, will begin at the high school tomorrow. Um, meanwhile, across the district, there are a, a number of celebrations, fifth grade and eighth grade move up ceremonies, field days, carnivals. Um, and so it is a very festive time. And again, uh, really heartwarming to see many of our traditions return um, after two years of uh, alternative celebrations that we've had uh, in years past. Um, we have several teams um, in postseason play at the high school uh, at 430. I don't have a game update, but the girls varsity lacrosse team took on Lincoln Sudbury away. Um, the boys varsity baseball team uh, is playing this evening as we speak. They are in the final four and they are playing uh, Shrewsbury tonight at Holy Cross. And uh, the boys varsity lacrosse team is also at Lincoln Sudbury tonight. They had their game begin at 630. Speaking of sports, fall sports registration is already open for the fall. So that is underway. Um, I thought the committee might be interested in hearing that a science fair club uh, held its inaugural meeting on June 8th. 
And uh, also in recent news, um, the World of Difference peer leaders at the high school um, solicited interest through an application process and 150 students uh, applied and were accepted to participate in the Walk Against Hate, which occurred last week on June 9th um, as a, um, the group walked together to take a stand against hate, uh, both locally and uh, in, uh, as a response to some of the most more recent news stories. Um, last week, we had a policy uh, subcommittee meeting, and um, I think uh, Mr. Callahan will speak later uh, during, Frank, during um, information matters, um, but we talked about uh, the uh, policies that we have in place for our safety practices and for planning, and I thought that the superintendent's report might be an opportunity to um, further elaborate on some of the planning that happens that uh, many members of the community are probably not uh, aware of. Um, if people are interested in learning more about our safety practices, there is a presentation from October of this year uh, that Mr. Jagir and Mr. Augusta presented on um, that would be a good um, starting place and set of resources. Um, and then uh, we recently reissued um, our threat assessment memo and our safety response um, information, uh, which we typically do in the fall, but reissued it more recently. Um, one of the things that we talked about at the policy uh, subcommittee is um, our practice of having a comprehensive town-wide emergency management team. And this team uh, meets regularly. Um, it involves a town administrator and uh, Mr. Helen's staff members. Uh, the assistant superintendent and myself, uh, our school business administrator, our technology director, uh, members of the fire department, members of the police department, the building inspector, the facilities director, and I'm sure I'm forgetting other folks that participate in a comprehensive townwide emergency management team. We're fortunate too here in Franklin uh, because of the proximity of MEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management uh, Agency is right here in town. And we have uh, held meetings both in the MEMA facility and we've also held meetings at the Franklin Fire Department. We also include Verizon and National Grid representatives. Um, so we have um, plenty of information and emergency um, response information uh, from them. Uh, and uh, this is really intended to be uh, very comprehensive for all sorts of uh, emergencies that we may find ourselves responding to. In addition, we have district and school-based emergency management planning, uh, school administrators, our resource officers, fire department officials, counseling staff, and nurses as needed uh, focus on district and school-based emergency uh, planning. In terms of plans, um, we do uh, seek to convey uh, as much communication as we're able, um, but we don't uh, purposefully, we don't, um, we don't um, communicate all of our plans um, to uh, members of the community as much as they might want or call for full transparency um, that actually would put um, our security and safety practices uh, in jeopardy and create some vulnerabilities. Um, and so we um, coordinate tightly with the police department and with the fire department on what would be appropriate to share. We have a comprehensive emergency response manual, um, which covers, uh, again, all sorts of things that you might imagine, including fire emergencies, gas leaks, evacuations, uh, lockdowns, administrative lockdowns, classroom containments, which we use in different, um, different settings, bomb threats and searches, suspicious packages, disruptive behaviors, medical emergencies, bloodborne pathogens, uh, situations that might involve a drug overdose, fights, incidents on a bus or van, including accidents, uh, suicide threat or attempts, uh, severe weather, and would serve as a basis for a nuclear threat. So I don't mean to scare people, I just want to elaborate and convey uh, the depth around which we have emergency plans in place. Um, the district also has a school safety implementation plan, which was a three-year plan that augments the emergency response plan uh, around practices and protocols, safety training, uh, facilities assessments and upgrades, and communication systems, uh, particularly as it relates to lockdowns and classroom containments. Uh, lastly, um, we are required um, and we, we submit to the Department of Education annual medical emergency response plans, which are intentionally school-based plans uh, that are intended to reduce the incidence of life-threatening emergencies and to promote efficient response responses to such emergencies. 
Um, so again, I'm not uh, looking to uh, alarm anyone. I just want to uh, convey the extent to which we have comprehensive plans in place and we regularly meet and update uh, those plans uh, across a variety of emergency management teams. And again, Mr. Callahan will talk a little bit more about the conversation we had at the policy subcommittee related to your three policies around uh, safety. A couple of uh, weeks ago, I gave you an update on the tiered focus monitoring review um, for the report we received from the uh, related to our special education department. Um, we have received the report related to English language development. Um, as I had told you at that time, there's a team from the department that visits every six years to review the district for compliance across several programs. Um, the special education report had uh, uh, has since been published and had no findings. Um, related to English language, um, we have nine standards that were rated as implemented. So that would be no finding or the finding of that they're implemented. Um, we did have three standards rated as partially implemented and our ELD coordinator has outlined action steps that we are taking um, to get these to be in the implemented category. Uh, the good news is that we knew about these and these steps have been underway. Uh, the first, um, we were cited for not enough uh, English language development staff, and uh, that is being rectified in the FY23 budget with the additional positions that you have approved to support the increased number of English learners in the district. Um, around um, parent involvement, um, DESE cited the district as having strong communication methods with Regroup and our telephonic interpretation service. Um, at the classroom and school level, um, Google Translate has been a main go-to, and the Department of Education is asking us to review and apply alternative translation solutions. There are some more, um, uh, I hate this word, but robust uh, applications that have since uh, been developed, uh, and so we are exploring those through the technology department. And then lastly, um, licensure requirements. Um, is something uh, for us to be paying attention to. Most of our educators hold SEI endorsement um, and uh, some do not. And so we will be monitoring uh, SEI endorsement more closely with our placement decisions and making sure uh, that we're supporting our educators and earning these credentials. Um, so those are the three areas um, that we are working towards. Um, recently, uh, CIC, which is the testing, um, the testing, uh, company uh, that had been um, providing uh, tests in school and antigen testing for home use um, issued a report and there's an infographic that we can post uh, online uh, with Franklin specific information. Um, and I thought through our testing program, you might be interested that they quantified uh, that uh, 5,751 uh, total samples were tested across 10 participating schools. 4,436 school days were saved uh, through the testing program uh, for students who otherwise would have had to uh, quarantine, and that over 50,000 antigen tests were distributed um, to students and staff uh, through the program. So um, just a few, uh, few interesting tidbits there for you. Um, Mr. Jagir and I attended, there's a lot in here. There's a lot going on. It's only been three weeks, but there's a lot. Um, Mr. Jagir and I attended the uh, spring meeting of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents. Uh, the focus was on race, equity, diversity, and inclusion work of our professional organization. They are conducting this work internally as an organization while also developing and providing resources and support to superintendents and districts. The day started with the keynote speaker from Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Education, Regina Robinson. Uh, Regina shared her story uh, as a woman of color, um, while also um, talking about being a parent of a child with disabilities. Um, so she talked about having an ability to visualize educational attainment through many lenses. She presented with energy, enthusiasm, and hope for the future of public education. Following her presentation, we had the opportunity uh, for a facilitated table talk. Um, and uh, relaying how the Department of Education can help support our work in this area. Uh, following a break, um, we heard from uh, the Assistant Superintendent of Old, Old Rochester Regional School District, who shared insights into her story and the consequences of teaching and learning an incomplete history. Uh, 
Kamal Basin, the Senior Associate Commissioner of DESE, um, shared the existing DESE requirements related to curriculum, focusing on establishing curriculum standards that support accurate information. Commissioner Riley joined the morning program and shared brief remarks on a variety of topics, including COVID, educator pipeline initiatives, and curriculum. Um, the uh, president of our association closed out the main session by presenting the 2022 Distinguished Service Award to Jeff Parati. Um, this award is presented annually to a non-member of MASS in recognition of outstanding service to and support for public education and the children of Massachusetts. Jeff is the founding director of the Massachusetts Department of Elementary, Elementary and Secondary Education Safe Schools Program for LGBTQ youth. Uh, consistently, um, district and building leaders call on Jeff to provide support and guidance in supporting students. And lunch uh, followed with awards and recognitions. And I believe uh, the Desi Safe Schools has done some work in Franklin uh, in past years uh, to provide professional development and support. Um, as a reminder, um, we do not have school on Monday, June 20th. Um, it is the recognition of Juneteenth. Last year, Juneteenth became both a state and federal holiday, recognizing the effective end of slavery in the United States when federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865, uh, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. When the holiday falls on a Sunday, as it does this year, the day is recognized on the following Monday. So we are out of school on Monday the 20th. And that is the conclusion of my report. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hearn. Okay, so any follow-up questions or comments for Dr. Hearn? We'll start with Callahan. Thank you. Um, yeah, really, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot to talk about there. One of the big things, so I um, think the, the, the top of the report, you just uh, really uh, spoke about the end of the year celebrations uh, that are back as a, um, as a dad of a fifth grader who's kind of going through a lot of that stuff uh, right now, it's, it's outstanding to see. I'm not personally ready for it uh, to happen, but, but I love everything that, that is happening. Uh, so I just I want to uh, thank all of the, the teachers, the faculty, uh, the family members, the parents of the, across the entire community uh, that is putting together uh, in, in their time, the dedication to making sure that all of these events happen. Uh, the smiles across all the kids' faces. Uh, show that it's it's welcomed and they're, they're so excited to kind of have so much of this stuff back uh, and it's wonderful and uh, otherwise I just want to a big uh, big thank you and also to uh, to the entire community uh, that came on out for uh, really like the, the heroes return uh, uh, for uh, um, our unified basketball team it was uh, absolutely amazing uh, so uh, thank you all for for those who turned out as well for that. Great, thank you, Charles. Yes, oh, um, <laughs> I'm going last names. It's just easier with the two days. Gotcha, makes sense. Um, but it brought a smile to my face when I heard you say science for club. Um, I was hoping, could you elaborate a little bit about that? Like, what's what, what's their goal and what, what are they going to try to do? So um, I have probably have to get back to you on some of the details related to that. Um, but I did see them advertise that they were going to host an inaugural meeting um, to have a science fair brought to Franklin High School. So I think they're just getting organized now, but there um, there's a, a group of interested students. Um, so I saw them, I either saw it in the newsletter that Mr. Hanna sends out or I saw it on Twitter, but they um, had a club meeting last week, the 8th. Gotcha, great, I'm excited. Hopefully that will spur some other medals as well and other accolades <laughs> for Franklin. Um, and then the other question I had was around the, the uh, CIC for the COVID testing. Um, can you elaborate what's the plan for next year for regards to testing? Sure, I will turn it over to Paula. Yes, um, so the state is no longer funding the testing kits um, next year and um, given the amount of, we're, right now we're just using the test kits um, that we have in our health offices for symptomatic testing, but that number is quite low um, in comparison to what it was in the past. So we, we will no longer be providing symptomatic testing. I mean, we will no longer be provide, providing at-home tests. So basically the testing program is finished. Yeah. So. Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hearn, for um, all these updates. It was great to have our gold medalists in the house. And uh, it's and also great to hear about the other um, Franklin sports teams are having such great success. So yeah, so thank you for the update. The <clears throat> Um, information on the um, emergency 
uh, management team, as well as the, the safety plans. I think that's also, that's very valuable information for um, us in the community to have, to know that there are you know, plans and procedures in place. You now, should something happen, which you know, of course we all hope, hope it doesn't, but at least at the very least we're prepared and we're giving thought to these things. So thank you for that update. Mm -hmm. And also um, giving us the update that with the tiered focus monitoring that the um, that the three standards raised is partially implemented are being addressed. So it's you know, good to know that we're on top of these things and getting ready for next year. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. What more? Um, uh, yeah. Th yeah. Thank you very much for that, that detailed report. And uh, I'm really uh, yeah, proud of our, uh, you know, gold medal winners. And um, I'm also excited about the possibility of the science for starting. I personally really enjoyed, uh, you know, participated in the science fair when I was a high school student years ago. So thank you. Great. Bernstein. I'd like to echo the comments about the end of the year celebrations and remind people watching that it doesn't happen without parent volunteers. I see um, emails come out. They're so um, friendly, uh, but I think the administrators are stressed about um, some of the events need volunteers and they can't happen without the volunteers. And if you've ever had 300 middle schoolers in a certain place. Um, it may be at the middle school level that your middle schooler is like, I don't want you there. Um, I was told where I was allowed to be at a certain place, um, but we desperately need people to help out at your school. So make sure you sign up when you get those um, really calm, but behind the scenes, probably a little stressed emails. Thanks. That's a really good point. Thank you for that. Um, I don't have any further questions. Just want to thank you for always providing thorough, informative in, uh, superintendent reports. We always learn a lot and really feel like we have the fingers on the pulse of the of the district. So thank you, Dr. Hearn. Thank you. Can I, um, as we move on to the agenda, yes. um, I'm just, would the committee uh, possibly entertain going slightly out of order for um, presentation B before presentation A? Yes, I was thinking standpoint? the same thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So um, for the community, presentation B is the Norfolk County Sheriff's Office comfort dog, and they've been making adorable dog noises in the corner. And so we feel like we just can't move on to the amazing civics projects until we get all the all the adorable dog stuff out of the way. Yeah. So, so I'd like on. to welcome. Um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know sure. your name, um, but so, you're representing Norfolk County Sheriff's so Office. So my name is Officer Mike Monaghan. Thank you all for having me. This is K9 Eddie. Eddie is nine months old, um, and we have been everywhere in the county, basically, of Norfolk. Uh, I work for the Sheriff's Department, so we cover all the 28 uh, towns in Norfolk County. Uh, I met a fine officer in the, in, who has a company dog who does exactly what I do, and we're just speaking over there very quietly about how we're absolutely <laughs> overwhelmed, and it's the best thing that you could do. So a little history on me. I was on the narcotic unit with a narcotic canine for nine years. Uh, I retired my narcotic canine, and the sheriff, uh, Pat McDermott, allowed me to get this comfort dog. So I was lucky enough to be able to get it. I went to a place called American Canine Services down in Middleborough. We rescued him and his whole litter of brothers and sisters from Florida. Uh, we put him through training, uh, a little under three months. I went three weeks. I finally got to meet him. We got all our state certifications. And here we are in front of you guys. Um, we do a lot in veterans homes. We do a lot in schools. We do a lot in Milton Hospital, which is in my, which is over in uh, Milton. And we go over to South Shore Hospital over in, uh, in Weymouth. We haven't got in there yet. It's a lot of paperwork to get in with COVID and everything. Um, it helped me out because my wife's a nurse over in Milton for 20 years. So she kind of stuck me in a little bit and it was the process <laughs> going a little bit. But um, like I said, the most rewarding things I think I do is I just got finished doing all the kindergartens in Norfolk County. I was here in Franklin. Um, we sent out an email before we got Eddie to name them. So the winning names were Edgar and Buddy. So we kind of combined the both of them and we came up with Eddie. So we visited all the kindergartens with the winning names, which was six of them total. There was 1,600 names that were emailed over to us from all various kindergarten teachers all throughout Norfolk County. So like I said, I've been doing this for a little under a month now and it's seven days a week. 10 hours a day. Everybody wants to meet Eddie. Yeah. And it's a very rewarding job. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. I get to come up and I get to talk to you guys and I get to go to the schools. Uh, like I said, we do a lot with the veterans. Uh, we do a lot with the schools, the veterans, and the hospitals. Like I said, we just recently got into the hospitals. So it's been very, very busy. So I can take any questions. Uh, you're going to see a lot of me. Like I said, I'm just getting rolling. Uh, I'm going to 
get together with this officer over here and between the two of us, we're going to help each other out, cover each other and try to do as much as we can in every town. Um, over here, like I said, my contact information is online. And if anybody would like a business card, I can leave it. If you ever think that you need, if there's ever anything going on in the town, um, we're more than welcome to come over. The sheriff's allowed me to be able to come out and be out the boat. And just kind of, he says, just don't answer to me, answer to the public and go out and do your thing. So uh, he unfortunately is in Denham and wasn't able to make it. He just called me. He got tied up with a parade in Denham that's still going on. <laughs> so he asked me just to kind of come up and say a few words. So is there any questions that you could have for me or? So many questions. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll maintain order. And um, Dave Callahan? No, just uh, thank you so much for coming down. Hands down, one of the better meetings that we've had uh, this is, uh, yeah. entire term. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming on down. I really appreciate it. I'll just go. Thank you so much as well. And I feel like if, if you're done with your question and want to do a quick visit to Eddie, that's okay. Just yep. a little bit quiet. Okay. <laughs> Al Charles, because I'm going to do that. <laughs> Al Charles. Yes. So, so thank you for your time. Much, much appreciated. Uh, I guess my question is, do you do house calls? Because we do have a... <laughs> yeah. so, 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 so actually, it's a great question. So even like dealing with a lot of the veterans, I get, I get to talk with a lot of the veteran agents and they kind of want to include house calls. So it's all about safety on my end. It's just me and Eddie going into some of these homes that I'm not aware of. And I have no problem with doing house calls, but we're going to have to build up a certain criteria of when it allows us to go into the house and when it doesn't allow us to go into the house. So right now we're currently working on all of that, uh, kind of putting some things in policy, what I'm allowed to do, what I'm not allowed to do. I just don't ever want to put him or myself in danger going into someone else's home and really not. You know, we're used to kind of command and control. But we know the situation we're walking into 99% of the time. Um, I don't think I would know too much of the situation if I would just call to a home. Um, we're also trying to put a task force together throughout North Fork County, which would be all of us. Um, when we do like a paging system, if there's a tragedy, if there's a house fire, if there's anything, hey, we'll put this out on the paging system. I think there's about 28 dogs right now that are comfort dogs within North Fork County. Um, I know Brainfree School Department just put a comfort dog in the school department itself. And they had enough money where they hired a handler, not a police officer or a sheriff's deputy, one of their own in the schools. They pay the handler to get the dog and go to training, and it's working out amazing. Not that I'm throwing that on. No, <laughs> no, I'm trying to catch eyes with this guy right here. I saw you. I did a handler. And like I said, if you ever need any information on that, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you. The cost is nothing compared to you know the product and the outcome when these mm -hmm. kids see a dog running around the school. And, as you have right behind me to take no work from this gentleman behind me, but there's so much work that it's just, it's just, there's nothing about it. And like I said, we were talking earlier in the corner and people love seeing me come now. You know, when I was on the narcotics task force, they didn't like it. <laughs> so now it's, I show up and everybody smiles and I smile and it's a rewarding feeling. Yeah. You know, so. What else we got? Dave McNeil. <laughs> uh, well, thank or, you. Al, you have a second one? Oh, that was it. Thank okay. you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm so happy that, uh, yeah, that, that, that is a valuable part of the, uh, that, that is a valuable part of the work show department, and, and you too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, since Sheriff McDermott took over, he, uh, he, he's done a lot of things on the outside. He's a big outside guy being a sheriff. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the first time we have had this, and it took off. Yeah. So uh, it's just bigger and better things to come with him being on, on the throne and in charge. And uh, so here we are. So, like I said, we just, he wants me out here. He wants me talking to you guys. He wants the town and Franklin to know that we're here and we can help or whatever we need. Absolutely. We appreciate it, officer. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I mean, so you have the best job in the world. I, I mean, I, you're hard pressed to argue that. So yeah. I guess my, my only question is what what's is Eddie regularly scheduled on the second and fourth Tuesday of right. every month from yeah. seven to nine? Right. Be the first. All right, there we go. <laughs> we, we appreciate that. We can get a dog bed for the coroner. We That's can bring fine. trees. That's fine. Yes. Well, Whitmore. All right. Well, I have two things. So uh, the first is my uh, corny dog joke that yeah. everyone knows. Like, crack. We we have two dogs in our household, and they're okay. they're dog unenjoyable. And <laughs> uh, the, the other thing is, uh, so we're having a, a town Franklin Pride event. I, I could, I'll contact you about. It. I'll take one of your cards. But on the twenty sixth Sunday at the town common, uh, yeah. we're, we're doing a thing. And mm -hmm. yeah, if you want to uh, come by with uh, the dog, that'd be that'd be fantastic. Yeah. No problem. Thank, Thank you, Alice. Yes.
Camille Bernstein. I'm looking at Lucas. Um, I try not to talk about my district, which is in Middlesex County, but we oh. do have a dog at the high school. And whenever Sassy is in town and the screens say the Sassy's in the library, everybody's happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I guess my most important question is, who's a good boy? <laughs> who's a good boy? <laughs> So I think only nine months too. I, I feel that. So he's a rescue, so we don't know his exact age. But to be nine or ten months and to be this calm, uh, yeah. like I said, a lot of work goes into it. We have to, we are all state certified. So we have to make mm -hmm. state certifications. And my certification was I walked around the tractor supply store. If you've ever been in the tractor supply store, there's animals, there's everything, and he basically passed with flying colors: sit down, stay, uh, sit and stay, all that stuff. They just well, the state wants to make sure, especially going into schools. It could be as little as jumping up innocently and scratching somebody on the arm. Yeah. And then we know where we all stand. You know, there could be major issues. So as far as, like I tell everybody, the most that Eddie's going to do is you're going to feel the wetness of his nose and he might give you a kiss. <laughs> if, if that's damning, then I don't know what else to do. But that's kind of what, what he's trained. So uh, a lot of work goes into it on our end. And it's a lot of phone calls. It's a lot of late hours. But like I said, there's nothing better when you're walking along, even with the kids, walking to a kindergarten classroom and they're instantly zoned in on the dog. <laughs> it wouldn't be bad to get a full time. I know. I know. <laughs> you need to leave a number of your cards somewhere. And, I absolutely. Well, yeah. I yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, could you also maybe walk him around? Sure. So, what I'll do is you guys can continue on. <laughs> I'll go see the crowd and then I'll kind of sneak behind you guys. If that's okay, and you guys can all get back. That's Thank you. All right, well, Thank I you. appreciate you having me. Thank I'm you so sorry much. the sheriff couldn't come. Like I said, uh, you'll see a lot more of them with all the events and everything planned. Uh, and we do have the kids' camp. So we did do the kids camp and uh, it's it's not once a week, I believe it's seven weeks this year. Yep. So yep. Eddie will be at every one of those. We'll also have a canine demonstration at those. So I'll bring my narcotics okay. canines yep. down and they'll do a demonstration for the kids and how the narcotics dogs work. And then Eddie will be, uh, you know, we'll come down and we'll see everybody then too. So you'll see a lot of us in the next couple of weeks. So how do, just for the community, how do they find out about that camp? So it's online. You can okay. go to the Norfolk County Sheriff's Office.org. And you go, you go on to summer camps and mm -hmm. it'll say there's, uh, there's seven weeks dedicated to Franklin. So Braintree does it every single week. That's where it started. Mm -hmm. And then we just built, well, not built the course, but we created a, a similar course that we have in Braintree, brought it down here. And last year was the kickoff year. We did it for one week. And now this year, it's so busy that there's seven weeks now. Wow. So for seven weeks, you're going to have it done. And it's down at the baseball fields. And I know the baseball fields because I have four kids at home. My oldest, my three daughters play softball at those fields. My oldest <laughs> plays baseball, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's down there and it's Monday to Friday and it's great for the parents. I'm telling you, it, it, it's a lot of, you know, I think you have to be a certain age, 10 or 11 years old, but it's a lot of skill building. It's learning how to be friends with everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's good. It's good stuff. Real good stuff. So look it up online. It's, you'll see me there. And if you don't see me there, you find all the data is there and you find out what I'm missing. I'll find it. Say, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> So. Thank you. I Thank think you so and I think it's hosted at Parmenter, maybe the baseball field. There's a baseball field behind yeah. Parmenter that okay. gets used, but it's um, hosted at Parmenter. Um, and we're yep. really like happy about that partnership and excited to be hosting again um, yep. for an great. expanded for expanded program. Wow, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Thank you for Thank coming. You um, and just to add uh, some detail, two of those six kindergarten classes, just for the community who may have missed the announcement a few months ago or weeks ago, um, were here in Franklin. So it was Mrs. Ford at Parmenter and Mrs. Rogers at Jefferson. Great. Thank you. So moving on to the eighth grade civics projects highlight. Great. So this is um, a long awaited uh, moment as the school committee has been asking to hear more about the civics projects uh, that is happening. Um, as you may remember, the state uh, issued new social studies frameworks a few years ago, I want to say in 2018. Um, then assistant superintendent for teaching and learning Joyce Edwards, along with a curriculum committee, um, adjusted the Franklin curriculum, especially the scope and sequence. Uh, related to how we were teaching social studies um, to then insert uh, in eighth grade um, a very civics focused uh, course and our teachers have done uh, tremendous work adjusting their curriculum and this is um, the second year of the civics projects last year though with covid and everything um, i don't think that 
they were fully able to implement them and bring them to life the way that they had hoped. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Ashley is with us tonight, the Director of Curriculum for ELA and Social Studies. She's going to introduce uh, a few teachers and um, several students who are here to share, um, proudly share their work with you on their civics projects. Um, we have um, guests from Horace Mann Middle School and the Annie Sullivan Middle School. Uh, Remington Middle School, I think, had one of those end of year celebrations um, today, uh, which was a conflict, um, but there is work happening at Remington and Dr. Ashley can share a little bit about a few projects from, from there. Welcome everybody. I know there's a little, oh, we're all, all ready to go. There we go. Super. Great. So I had a little bit, um, Dr. Hunt gave us a little bit of background, so I'm going to skip over some of this so we can get right to the kids. <laughs> but um, basically, um, in 2018, Governor Baker signed into law the act to promote and enhance civic engagement. And out of that came the civics project. So civics projects are required in Massachusetts for eighth graders, all eighth graders in public school and in high school. And in Franklin, it's our 11th graders. But tonight we're, um, we're really happy to have our eighth graders here to tell a little bit about their projects. So the six stages, um, first they examine um, self and civic identity. Um, they identify an issue, they research, they investigate, they develop an action plan, they take action, and then they reflect and they showcase. So this is part of the showcase, right? <laughs> All right. So we have with us tonight, we have Sam, we have Krithi, we have Ryan, and we have Maddie. Unfortunately, Asher's sick, right? And Mr. Mello is the, um, the teacher extraordinaire, and unfortunately, Mr. Um, Mr. Um, Ant oh, sorry, I said Mello. I said, yeah, Mr. Anthony um, is not feeling well, so he's really sad that he can't be here tonight, so I'm kind of stepping in for his place. Um, and then we have Mr. Mello has some um, students from Annie Sullivan, and Mr. Baca has brought some kids from Horace Mann. All right, so I'll let it kick it off for the kids. Domestic violence and women's rights have had an immense impact on our state and community. Recently, we have witnessed sickening examples of domestic violence in our area, which have piqued our determination to raise awareness and support victims of domestic abuse and sexual assault. As a community, it is crucial to offer help and reassurance to those struggling in vulnerable situations. No person should have to endure any acts of violence or sexism. We feel that as the next generation of our community, we are obligated to ensure that women all across our state and town have access to resources and do our best to prevent domestic abuse. Over the course of our project, we have collected many statistics and data regarding domestic violence. Listed to the right is the most prominent data we have found stated by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. NCADV is a nonprofit organization advocating for survivors of domestic violence. These statistics show how drastic abuse has become in our society today. It is extremely upsetting that we have become so desensitized to these acts of violence. One example is one in three women have experienced some form of physical violence. An act to protect victims of crimes and the public is a bill introduced by Charlie Baker, our governor. It claims to add to the list of offenses that require consequential hearings, eliminate ineffective action to address legal safety concerns, enforce more restrictions and detainments for offenders, and strengthen the ability of judges to enforce conditions of pretrial release. This bill will also include more crimes that qualify for trial, such as potential and or threatened violence and crimes of sexual abuse. There is um, a hearing on June 30th, 2022, where they will continue to discuss um, the progress of this. <coughs> Our project began with creating an informative website about the bill, as well as domestic violence. As said before, this entailed lots of research and preparation. After gathering information, we used Google Sites to create and publish the website. Our website provides statistics, hotlines, and details about women's rights domestic violence and Char Charlie Baker's proposed bill. Next, we decided to start spreading awareness by sending a Google form petition via email to the middle and high school students in our district, as well as their faculties. Students and committee me community members had the opportunity to sign, sending support and encouragement to Governor Baker and his team. Our petition also included further information regarding domestic violence, as well as the link to our website. 
To promote it, we sent a petition to our family, friends, and peers. We reached out to Governor Baker's office, and we are currently awaiting a response. Shown here is our proof of action. On the left are images of our website, and on the right are the results of our petition. Our next proof of action is the email we sent to the other schools and the email to Charlie Baker regarding the petition results. As a result of a petition and website, we have so far reached a total of 236 signatures in support for Governor Baker's bill. We are very satisfied with our successful results and hope that our efforts will continue to gain momentum to help create a more safe and equal future for women in our town and state. Our project also helped garner more support and recognition for Charlie Baker's bill, an act to protect victims of crimes in the public. Thank you for your time, as well as the opportunity to express our concerns and educate about domestic violence. We are extremely passionate about this prominent issue. We hope that the results of our project will encourage you to further support women across Massachusetts and demonstrate the importance of community, benevolence, and compassion. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment because um, I'm organizing things up here. I think we're going to do questions in between. Sure. Okay. okay. Yep. So if you have questions. Sure. Um, I'm sorry. It's my fault. I was disorganized. Yeah, sure. Yeah, good idea. Perfect. We're flexible. Um, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Uh, this kind of goes out, I mean, for um, uh, your project, for any other ones also that are kind of going out there. If there's ever, um, you know, feel free to, to reach out uh, to us if you ever want to, uh, you know, be happy to kind of add my name to, to that petition and to kind of work with any other groups uh, that are out there. Uh, please never hesitate to, to reach out. Um, and uh, just in, in regards to the domestic uh, violence, uh, just speaking of the community at large, um, there is a domestic violence uh, national hotline number, 1-800-799-SAFE. Uh, uh, just if there is anybody in the community that's currently listening, watching, um, that may be in a situation like that. But thank you so much uh, for, for the project and uh, just for, for shining a spotlight on that issue. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, so thank you for your, your time and your effort and energy you put into this. Um, I mean, as we all know, we had a tragic domestic violence circumstance this year as well, and frankly, that impacted our students. Um, so worthy cause to bring up and, and share and, and educate folks on, on, on the work that's being done. Um, and, and I may have missed it, but what was the website that you said, what was the URL to the website? Um, we can, we can send it like we can see if our teacher can send it to the committee because it's like a bunch of like it's, random, it's, it's on we made it from a google site so it's like a bunch of random gotcha. like digits okay. so we can um see if there's a way to send that out because okay. that's definitely something that um would be great to share and we have the link for our petition on there as well so if that's sent out that's also something that um, you guys um are welcome so okay Perfect. Yeah, because we'll, we'll, sure we'll make sure you get the slides. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to just get get more exposure for you yeah. and the work that you've done because it's, it's definitely commendable. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there that are suffering in silence that don't have the help and don't know where to go. And I think this may help shed a light on that. So, so thank you. Thank you, Dave Mitchell. Thank you very much for um, yeah, doing this project on, on such an important um, issue and yeah, shedding shedding light on um, just yeah the the. the legislation out there and resources there. So I mean, I, I work at the state house and I can just say it's just so important and valuable when uh, young people such as yourselves get involved in the legislative process and you know put your advocacy forward. And it means a lot. And yeah, it's it's excellent that you are paying attention to um, the bills that are out there and yeah, and the legislation that is being put forth. So yeah, thank you for all you've been doing. Great.
Make it what more. Yeah, th yeah, echo uh, what other members are saying. And thank you very much. It's uh, uh, really great that you're doing this. I echo what they're saying, but I also just want to say, I know many of you personally, and I'm just really proud of you. <laughs> That's great. So thank you for coming to present to us. I know it's sort of a, an intimidating room sometimes, and um, you were on TV, you're going to be on TV, and we're just so proud of all the work and effort you've put in here, and you, you make us proud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Without further ado. Uh, hello there, my name is Shane Davey. This is my friend and partner, Jack Aldred. We'll be covering our Team Angelo um, civics engagement projects and the process that we went through while working on these throughout the year. We started off during our beginning of the year teen time classes. We did some issue exploration. We went over like current events going on around the world and everyone grouped together, discussed things, and we made a big spreadsheet. And then everyone kind of narrowed down issues that they were interested in, like on researching. And once you found that, you began your research. And we would do our research papers in team time and English. And we would just research our issues to make a better argument to our representative, try to convince them that they should make, make an action on our, on our uh, solution to the problem. But to be able to do this, we had to make sure we were able to understand how like laws and bills and just the legal process worked in general. So during social studies and team time classes, we took the time to learn how a bill would become the law and the roles of committees and their importance. And from that, we, we went to look for who represents us. And what, what we were doing there is we were finding who would be a good target to send our letter to once we got our issue. And we would be looking for things like who's our representatives and who has past experience with these bills and who will actually take action based on the history of the bills. And once we found someone we felt would be a good advocate and person to write to, we began to draft our letters during team time and we made sure they were good, formal, well-written business letters. We had to establish a strong connection or just some sort of connection with the person. And we had to give them our statistics from our research papers. And once we sent that, we would hope for a follow-up and we'd also plan for follow-up. And our follow-up was a slideshow showcase where all, all the students would add a slide and they would have their their issue that they're focusing on and why. They would have their solution and how, how it would work, how it would fix the issue. They would have why they're targeting that representative and they would make sure to have their outcome, which would be a letter or email response from them. We're going to share a few examples with you now. We have mine. I wrote to Thomas Mercer, chairman of Franklin. I So I researched and I studied like the suffrage and the issues that pollinators and like, in, like insects in an ecosystem are going through. And I found that they're declining at like really strong, steady rates. And most people don't really care or even bother to know about this. But like if this keeps on going and we lose our pollinators, there'll be very major economic and ecological like consequences for something like this. So I dug around and looked for a solution and I found the Ordinance Law of Somerville, which is a pretty nearby town. It's over by Greater Boston area as well. And it kind of states that a percentage of native plants have to be planted in each public space to kind of combat invasive species and balance out the ecosystem level things. And I felt if Somerville is gonna have a law like that, why doesn't Franklin? So I figured why not speak to Tom and see if he'll, if he's willing to do anything about it, if he's got anything working on in motion. And he was, he responded very quickly. And he was, he told me some, some stuff about the green plan and changing to electrical, electric alternatives, like the fleet is being changed to electrical instead of gas. And he also said he was gonna to try to push forward the suggested ordinance law. And I'd say it was a very positive and successful outcome for that. This is the, letter I got from Tom. It's a pretty, it's a really nice looking formal letter. Um, <laughs> and in my showcase, I was focusing on gun violence in the United States. And as a very, a really recent example is the shooting in Uvalde, Texas at the Robb Elementary School, killing 19 students and two teachers. And there's also been 
I also learned that there's 3 million U.S. citizens who are affected by gun violence every year, like PTSD, trauma, and even the school shootings, some, some people are dying. And my solution to this was I was going to introduce a, a bill, no backdoor gun control act of 2022, which would ban assault rifles and machine guns from the definition of firearms, which would prevent school shootings and it would like lower the rate of gun violence. And I chose to send it to Jake Auchincloss in the US House of Representatives because he's my representative and he's gonna know I'm gonna vote for him in the future. But he also, he was a former Marine and he has practice with guns. He knows what they can do. And he also has uh, past bills and websites he's been working on for this issue. So I knew that he was gonna be a great pick. And he actually did respond. He sent a letter back. And in the letter, he talked about the four bills that he's already been advocating for. And he talked about one bill that he's advocating for right now. And he talked about his, his Marine experience. And uh, on the last slide of the letter, he talked about um, how 25,000 people could be saved every year if they had the Massachusetts gun laws, which I thought was just outstanding. That's, that's what mine was. And we, had, we included a few slides from some of the other students. My name is Jonathan Mello. I'm an um, eighth grade teacher at Annie Sullivan Middle School. Um, these are my friends, Jack and Shane, that we've been working all year. Um, just to give you a small sample of some of the other pres uh, other projects that students engaged in, um, Valerie Woodall was focused on mental health. Mental health for students was one of the most popular topics that students were interested in, in trying to get um, more counselors at the schools, more opportunity for kids to share how they're feeling. Um, she reached out to Dr. Hearn, but students dealing with that issue actually reached out to a number of different decision makers and policy makers in the state and in the district. Um, Paige Berry was focused on the impact of microplastics on the environment. She reached out to Ed Marquis. She's waiting for a response. And Emily Tullock was focused on mental health, and she was reaching out to uh, Karen Spilka, who is a state representative or state senator for our district. And then Cole McInerney was interested in um, prisons for profit and the, the idea of the private prison infrastructure. And so he wrote to Elizabeth Warren, and he's still awaiting a response. So that just gives you kind of a sample of what some of the other students were. I'm focused on. So that's it. That's it for Annie Sullivan. Wow. Do you have any questions at all? Or <laughs> That's so great. Thank you so much. Yes, Dave Callahan, want to go down the line? Yeah. Uh, first, I love the coordination. Yeah. Uh, because Same. of Shane's idea. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this is absolutely incredible. Uh, I remember kind of growing up, like you talked about, like the, the bill becomes a law. Uh, for me, it was, it was a video of Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> yep. I'm just a bill. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. It's a classic. This is outstanding. Uh, the, the, from the beginning with the flow chart kind of outlining exactly like the entire uh, track that you guys are doing, uh, finding a problem, researching a problem, and then making actionable changes uh, towards a solution is, is amazing. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for coming here, for all the, the work that kind of went in to each of those, uh, those letters, uh, and, and continue to do the work that you're doing, continue to advocate for yourself, for your community. Uh, it's, it's incredibly admirable and really just fantastic. And uh, I hope that in the future uh, that we can kind of continue to see these amazing uh, showcases at future school committee uh, meetings. It's, it's wonderful to really kind of see uh, what's happening uh, down at each of the, the schools and what's happening is, is incredible. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you. I'll try. Yes, thank you. Uh, so great work. Uh, uh, the presentation encompassed everything that we needed to hear. Um, and it just shows how there's the right way to go and make the changes and not the and versus the wrong way where other people may just go out and just complain. You are actually doing something about it. You're, you're taking the time to research, find out who to write to, communicating them, and really being very eloquent about what you want to see changed and really follow that process. So, so kudos to, to doing that and, and really share that with others as well. So, so thank you. Thanks, Al. Dave McNeil. Um, excellent job, guys. Um, yeah, not, not nearly enough people have an understanding of, you know, the legislative process and truly what goes into turning an idea into a law and um, yeah your presentation just yeah, broke it down 
um, so well. And then you know, your all all your respective actions of writing to the different legislators with you know, your idea and policy proposals. Um, yeah, just fa fantastic. Um, it's yeah, it can't be overstated just how you know important it is to yeah to to be active and to express you know, your opinions and and policy ideas to to elected officials and to understand how. Yeah, how a bill does become a law ultimately, and you know how you know, these laws do affect all of us um, in our in our day to day lives. And um, it's great that you can trace you know, an idea you have to the to the end result. So yeah, a great job. Really commend you. Please keep up the good work, and um, yeah, keep keep this process in mind for you know, the future when you go out and become voting citizens as well. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Thank you, Dave. Megan Whitmore. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for picking such you know serious topics and the. Um, in the education of, you know, who to contact, and um, you know, follow, researching, following up. I mean, I think that would just translate to, um, you know, other things, and you know, throughout your life, it's such a, a good, thorough way to approach them. So I'm really proud of this. Thank you. Great, thank you, Megan. Camille Bernstein. I'd like to echo what my colleagues have said, and also to recognize the teachers who facilitate these projects. It is not. Um, it's a lot of work to not only engage them in something they're interested in, but help facilitate the process. And um, although the first group, I knew some of them since kindergarten, I've recently met Shane. Uh, he was Daddy Warbucks and Annie Jr. And he was That's incredible. Was <laughs> right. I had COVID, so I didn't get to see it, but I watched the videos. Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> That's why you look Well, he has like hair now. He's shaved his head, committed to the role. He's a method wow. actor. Yes, well, <laughs> yes. Multi, multi, very talented. Anyway, um, um, big stuff happening. Yeah, yes, very true. Um, I The flowchart really helped me. Um, we haven't had civics projects presentations here at school committee and, and my kids aren't yet eighth graders. Um, so I don't really know the process. And so, you know, the first, the first group was a group and you all did individual projects. So is it sort of, um, is it student choice or sort of teacher direction? Like, how do you know how many and they actually um, sort of allow the structure? You to so you can do okay. it in small groups. You can do it in um, individual. And as teachers, we're still experimenting a little bit with the most effective way. I bet. Um, you can also do it as a whole class. And I think this might be another way that I try to conduct it next year mm. with having your class decide on an issue collectively and then break them into teams to deal with different tasks like a media team, a social media team, or a letter writing team, that type of thing. Um, so that it's kind of a work in process progress. We're still very much working out the most effective way to make change happen. So um, you probably next year you'll see something very different, but there is a lot of flexibility in it. And that's what kind of what makes it powerful. And that's exciting. And it sort of depends maybe on the group you have in front of you that yep. year. And maybe it lends itself to a huge project that needs little subcommittees. And maybe, you know, there's lots of tiny great ideas that can be worked on individually. So that's really exciting. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot to be said um, for students to work on things they're passionate about, right? It's much, much better than just writing an essay on some war and some dates and some, you know, some, uh, some events that you're not feeling connected to or inspired about. And so I think, you know, as you, as you grow and um, when we're adults out in the world, as, as my colleagues here said, you know, this, this is, this is what you do when you feel passionate about something, you could yell at your TV or you can, you know, do some research and write a letter and pick up the phone and, um, and create some, create some change. So thank you so much. We're proud of you. Thank you. For the last minute. We don't have any slides. That's okay. We like variety, creativity. <laughs> I've never sat at this table before. So <laughs> it's a bit different. But thank you all for um, for inviting us tonight. And I'm Rob Bachner. I teach eighth grade civics at um, Horace Mann Middle School. And before my friends introduce themselves. I just want to share a couple of things about the process as well. Um, I agree with you that, that when you tap into a child's passion, you get a huge return. And, and that's what we've, I, all three middle schools have tried to do with the civics project. Um, we started about a month ago, um, just talking about global and community issues. And I remember putting a, um, 
poster boards on, on the wall and having kids fill in some, what they were passionate about globally and community level. So um, I learned a lot. I mean, I never knew anything about shark finning until um, this process. And that's one of the projects that kids worked on. Um, we had several mental health um, projects trying to raise awareness. And that's really what the kids are trying to do is just raise awareness and get some results. And I had, we had a group who met with um, Principal Hannah at the high school to talk about, um, I think they wanted to blow out some, um, some woods to make some new exits to, for traffic. But they were, they were concerned about, about um, traffic. And what they really identified with that particular project was, um, and they interviewed high school kids and staff about you know, kids who are trying to get out for jobs, to get out for sporting events, and there's a big backlog of traffic and how can we fix that? Um, so there are those issues. And then what you're gonna hear from these girls tonight is their project, which was one of several that went to go reach out to the younger kids, which I think is really powerful. And um, kids identified issues around, around bullying. Um, there's one group that wanted, that started a, a mentoring program for fifth graders around homework and helping them develop and build skills. Um, these girls are gonna talk about pollution and how they talk to um, young elementary kids at Oak Street about pollution. And none of this happens without their passion and none of it happens with, with community involvement as well. I mean, we have kids who are contacting, I mean, Brad Hendrickson's a rock star because he is so accommodating for a gazillion emails that go out to him to arrange meetings. And, and again, the skills that kids are developing, how to arrange meetings, how to set up schedules, how to communicate and, and all the emails had to come through me. And I, their level of writing increased tremendously. Um, and <clears throat> I'm just trying to think of this. Um, oh, I some train of thought, I'm sorry. But anyway, they, um, their level of passion is tremendous. And, and, um, and I think raising awareness, the stories I get back from, from teachers, um, elementary teachers, in this case, who tell me a lot of kids were great and their kids, their elementary students were really engaged. And um, it's, I think it's really powerful. And um, I'm gonna stop and let them talk. <laughs> They're the stars, not me. So introduce yourself. Okay, um, I'm Isabel. Uh, I'm Carly C. Um, we're, our, we did our civics project on pollution and spreading awareness on how to improve and reduce pollution that occurs. Um, we like picked pollution because we thought like we should inform people about how to like prevent pollution and also how to like inform people on like trying to help and stop pollution. That's why we did it to younger kids too. So we could tell the younger generation of kids to tell like older kids and then they can just go on from there. Along with choosing a younger generation, it helps uh, in the future to reduce the amount of pollution that occurs and help spread the word to more people their age who also can want to understand what goes on. Um, we chose to reach out to first graders and talk to them on how to reduce pollution, how to help clean up pollution that occurs in our world, um, mainly to show like how a younger audience can one, understand it in a more simpler version, but also learn how to spread awareness on it and how you can help improve our environment and our ecosystem um, without doing too much work that might stress you out but enough work to make an improvement all around. Um, we included an activity to get the kids involved, to be more hands-on and help them understand more of the meaning of what pollution is and how we can help reduce it in our ecosystem. Uh, so we had a paper and we split it in half. One half is a side for like ocean, the ocean 
and what it looks like when it's polluted and then the other side when it's not polluted and we had them like show their comparison of what they believe and what they learned from our presentation on what um, pollution looks like versus what it'll look like once they make improvements and what they want it to look like in the future. And one of the keys to these projects too, I, I believe, is sustainability. I mean, how do you how do you keep these things going year after year? So when they introduce, and I think of, of, of helping our younger kids, when, when our students go out into the elementary schools, um, you know, how can you keep that rolling and just pass that, that torch, so to speak? Um, and, you know, on a funny side note, um, the kids are amazing. I, you know, the, the perseverance that, that you see in a classroom is unbelievable. I mean, they, they will stop at nothing to get information. They'll stop at nothing to get contacts. And when they don't, that's when they turn to the adult in the room. So um, I think the funniest thing that happened during this process for me was one day in particular, um, in one class period alone, I called the Franklin Police Department, the Department of Public Works, and a nonprofit in Oakland, California. And um, just to get contact information. And and um, and I was really influenced by the kids because I'm like, well, you know, they had this kind of like this carefree, let's do it attitude. So we'll place the phone calls and see what we get back. Um, we do have a poster they want to show you. It's a well-loved and well-traveled poster. So it's a little bit wrinkled. Um, and it's the poster that Carly, um, the activity that they that they did with the kids. And, um, and I think it's going to go back to Oak Street because the kids are really proud of it and they want to hang it up, which again, we'll share with the rest of that school. I love it because it's real. <laughs> it's like, it's so, uh, it's little kids. Tactile. Um, so like as you can see, like we have the before and after of the patients through our position. So like this I just for this and definitely we have like right colors. Air yeah, we have the air pollution and then the ocean pollution of course they like trash and like a mask in the ocean. And then they did like that happy version of colors mm -hmm. on that side. Mm -hmm. So they also have their different ideas of what pollution looks like in the ocean. But they all get like the general idea. Lots of sharks. For me, for me as the teacher, I I get really energized when they come back after their presentation or when they get a letter back and you saw the other groups from the other middle school they're getting responses back from these really important people. And their, their, their sense of pride that they did something, you know, they got something accomplished. And it's just real energizing for me. And it's really rewarding. And I can't imagine what it's like for them. Uh, and, you know, these these kids coming back, like, oh my God, the elementary kids loved us. Like, of course they did. They look up to you and, and you're doing something fun and cool and something you're tapping into their passion. So it's a ripple effect, which I think is really powerful. So, and again, I, I, you know, I, you know, you said it a few times tonight, Dave, about the community and community involvement, and you know, this is beyond a classroom activity. I mean, this is this is a community activity. Um, we have teachers involved, administrators, um, people who are quite surprised when they get phone calls and emails from the community that eighth graders want to contact them. They get excited, so it, it's 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 a pretty cool activity. And they do a ton of work. The kids do a ton of work. I mean, you saw the research that the other groups have done. You know, all kids do that pretty well. And, and I want to reach out, shout out to the teachers in the other middle schools mm -hmm. because, um, you know, we we communicate with one another, and we're looking. We're still, I think, Jonathan said, we're still looking to refine it and come up with best practices as well. This so. is so awesome. Thank you so much. And. Questions or comments? Say Callahan. 
You guys can stay up there for a minute. You can stay up there for a minute. <laughs> This was uh, uh, yet again uh, fantastic. Um, I love the idea of going into the classrooms, uh, talking to 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 those younger kids. I hope you uh, know too that uh, you, you made such an indelible mark on those first graders. They had the big kids, the grownups were, were coming into to their classroom. I guarantee you, this is something that went home about. They talked about at the dining room table. Uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, and for, for all of the teachers uh, that are involved, um, you know, really, as you, as you start the planning process next year, if really, please don't hesitate to, to tell your students to reach out to, I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody, but I'm sure I can, uh, to reach out to all of us. We'd be happy to, to help uh, in, in any capacity. That we these have. kids don't realize it. Like my students don't realize it. I go home to my wife and I'm like, you wouldn't believe what some of these kids are doing. And it's, it's, it's remarkable. It really is. It's, it's, uh, this whole night has been uh, uh, just incredibly exceptional. Uh, across uh, students across all of Franklin. So thank you so much for sharing your work. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Dave. I'll talk. Yes. So yes, thank you for the time coming in here, presenting, sharing your work. Um, I love the approach of allowing the students to have the creativity to really tap into what they want to speak on and really then use that passion to, to really expand on it and, and bring energy to it and really keep it going forward. Um, the involvement, as David said, with the, the younger kids, phenomenal. The, the kids will definitely be speaking about this for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And you should, the students should know that your voice, the younger kids, go further than probably us adults. So <laughs> so you're, you're, you have so much more power. And thank you for, for sharing that and really trying to get them to really focus on how they can reduce the pollution and really how to improve the world. So, so thank you. Okay. Dave McNeil. Yes. Uh, wonderful job. Thank you so much for presenting this to us, but also for uh, the work that you did on this project. I mean, of course, such an important issue, you know, the, the environmental impacts of pollution, and uh, I mean, that affects all of us now, but of course, you know, generations to come. And I mean, that you, know, you had it exactly right when you're know, going toward you know, going and presenting um, this project and information to you know, the, the youngest students to really, um, you know, Hammer, hammer this home to them, and you know, get them to learn from a young age just the um, the impact that um, that pollution is having, both you know, you know globally and locally. And, and you mentioned that, um, of course, before how you know these are issues that are you know both you know global and local. And um, yeah, well, it reminds me of a, a phrase that you know someone that didn't yeah came not too far from here did pretty well for himself. Um, the the phrase all politics is local, mm -hmm. and uh, that's um, that's exactly true with this. And these are issues that you know you might think in you know, big. In big terms, but it affects us right here in Franklin as well. So, thank you for um, yeah for uh, this project. Great, Megan Whitmore. Uh, yeah, another fantastic project. And I uh, I saw you when I was entering holding that weathered poster, and I thought I wonder what that's about. But I was I terrified that I was going to forget it. <laughs> I told them I I had notes at home. I had notes at my desk at school, and then I finally today I just put it in my car. Right. Right. <laughs> But I know it's a really great project. We only have one earth, right? We have to take care of it. And uh, yeah, th thank you very much. Okay, Camille Bernstein. I don't have anything that my colleagues haven't already said. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm so glad you didn't forget the poster because it really, it's like the visual yeah. speaks a thousand words. It's really just so exciting and all the little little first grader drawings and the happy sharks. And um, <laughs> it's it's just awesome. And the ripples, I think Robbie hit it on the head there. It's the ripples there. So there's right. a teacher that inspires eighth graders that inspire first graders. And it just, no, you know, they it gets... inspire me back. They do. Mm -hmm. So I bet. I bet. Do you hear that, guys? That's a big compliment to you. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Let me just finish up real quick because I don't want to. Um, Remington couldn't be here um, tonight, but just real quick, they just sent me some samples. So Remington's all in on this too um, with uh, Mrs. Um, Ms. Ambrose and Ms. Alberg. So just uh, two, um, there were tons of projects, but two that kind of stood out to me just because of the interest and the passion. And you see there's a wide range of interests, which is 
uh, which is wonderful. I bet we'll see some of those first graders when they're eighth graders probably come and do a civics project on pollution, right? Um, and then also the kids in eighth grade, they can also continue these projects in 11th grade so they can change or they might want to continue on. Um, in 11th grade into like more complex or to continue on. So that's another um, another avenue. So in Remington, they uh, one of the groups worked on social media. They were really concerned about censorship and limiting rights to free speech, really heavy duty, uh, complex thinking, and just looking into um, some of their solutions were unbiased monitoring of social media posts and just how, how that would happen and reaching out to, um, reaching out, um, to people about that. And then poverty was another another project, really thinking about how it affects people locally and um, in the world and what can be done, what can be done. They really talked about raising awareness, education opportunities. Um, then they really kind of got into existing government programs and did a lot of research, which was really interesting, just about increasing employment, unemployment insurance they were researching. They were talking about child care, senior care programs, earn tax income credit. Um, so really like diving into um, solutions for poverty. Um, so great job. So good, big shout out to Remington as well. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. So, yes. Okay. Sure. Yes, sure. Um, so, I guess it's Dr. Harden to Mr. Tagir. Um, do we have another district newsletter before the end of the school year? We do. Is mm -hmm. it possible to get like links to like their presentations or repository where folks can look at it? Because as a parent, I would think I mean, as a fifth grader going into well, as a parent of the fifth grader going into the sixth grade, I'd love to know about this and what he's going to have in eighth grade. And I think other families would love to see this and experience with what other kids are doing so yeah we can work towards getting some samples um, put in the district newsletter um we will i just want to say this for um any parents who might be watching you know we would look for permissions we won't take anybody's work without um mm -hmm. credit and approval but we can work on um providing some um providing some samples thank you great thank you anybody else any questions no Okay. All right. Moving along. Space needs presentation. So I'm going to shift over to the laptop, but I want to say my uh, thanks to our students and teachers uh, and their families. Um, yeah. And their families for coming out tonight and sharing the civics projects. Um, we really, really appreciate it. You're doing amazing work. I love the delay as everyone's having to say hi to Ben Frank on the way out. No one wants to stay for I don't know why. I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm taking this personally. <laughs> We're still here for you. Yeah. I know they thought you said you needed space. <laughs> that was Steve Sherlock. That was all Steve Sherlock. I just have a question. Okay. At least I thank you for saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Space needs. All right. Uh, we'll just wait for the PowerPoint to oh, sure. up and then we'll, we'll begin. Got all the time in the world. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, just changing accounts. Oh, good. Well, it's asking me to sign in again. It was fun to have so many people here tonight. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. It's good energy. It's a nice capstone. Yeah, the year right. Exactly. Celebration. It's busy. Yeah. Um, so it's I think there should be some requisite dad jokes with every presentation. Dad jokes? Yeah, every presentation should have some dad jokes. Like dog on. <sighs> Yeah. Okay. For next time. Next time. Okay. We'll just make sure we have our quota ready. Thank you. We've got to the experts.
Yeah, I'm just getting it ready. For those of you that are at home, we're just having a little technical delay with the projector. We're just building anticipation. And it's, it's riveting space needs. <laughs> I feel like um, how about all about that <laughs> instead of all about that space you could do all about that space okay <laughs> i actually used that for my kids to teach them about mla citation it's all about that space about that space no comma oh so you could you could adopt that song. Okay, I'll okay. I'll, I'll take under advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm vamping here while we're getting ready. Right, so we're we ready. Right, I'll shut up. Okay. Okay. Uh, so for the next three hours, we'll talk. Space, <laughs> <laughs> but just kidding. Um, so we'll just start talk about the agenda real quick, and then just give you a sense of what we'll talk through, and then we'll get into the content. Um, so for our agenda, um, we'll start off with the 20, uh, 2022 Space Needs and Facilities Assessment Subcommittee Summary. So really just summarizing what we've done. Um, we'll jump into some external factors just to make sure you're aware of what may be impacting the town or not impacting the town. And then we'll jump into a deeper dive of each of the facilities and just give you a sense of what we've identified during our assessment. And then last but not least, we'll end it with some recommendations and, and next steps. Um, so moving on to just the summary, um, as you can see here on the slide, um, <clears throat> just wanted to really make sure that you all understood what the purpose of the subcommittee was about. Um, this was not a committee deciding on any changes. It was really more of a, a fact-finding committee um, to help us determine what is our next potential steps and, and really uh, get everybody up to speed on where we're at from a facility standpoint. Um, so we did an internal assessment of our, our facilities. Um, this was a combination of work with Elise, Denise, um, Dr. Hearn, <coughs> Paula Morano, um, Mary Goodman, uh, Mr. Jagir as well, and uh, really just an assessment of really what we're what we're facing from a from a facility standpoint. Um, we reviewed some documentation from previous school committees, uh, space needs work. We've reviewed um, data that we've had um, readily available or we had to, to dig for. Um, then from there, really what we're doing now is communicating the findings to all of you so that you are aware of what we found and just get a sense of, of where we're at. And then last but not least, developing what is our path forward. Um, now that we've identified some of these issues or items, what do we do next and what's, what are the next steps? So you all may be asking yourself, well, why now? So first and foremost, the, the last time we really did something of this nature um, from a redistricting standpoint was back in uh, 2002 when we opened Keller and Andy Sullivan. Um, and at that time, Franklin was in a different place. We were we had expanded growth um, and needed space. Uh, we were busting at the seams. So the, the creation of Andy Sullivan and Keller was, was done to help address that, that concern. Um, also, since we've done, uh, since we've not counting Davis there, since we've last done a space needs uh, subcommittee, um, the use of space has significantly evolved uh, between what we're seeing in COVID, where we're having more space needs, what we're seeing with our um, specialized programs where we're looking for more space and, and really how we teach our students has evolved as well. Um, it's no longer what folks expect such as sitting at a desk and working individually. Now it's more group work, collaborative work, um, leveraging space differently so that you can um, be more effective and uh, really just be collaborative. Um, also, when we closed Davis there last year, um, Part of the work was to address the conditions of the building and not necessarily focusing on the district as a whole. Um, for those that are not aware, um, Dave's there, gorgeous building. Um, unfortunately, it just didn't meet the needs, uh, the growing needs of um, the community, um, especially when it comes to ADA um, support. So, <clears throat> so when we closed that school, we, in the, the thought to 
the least impactful students. We've just moved the group of students together as a whole into a facility that had the space to support it and not necessarily looked at the whole district as a whole to see if it will, how do we make this uh, future proof? It was really war. How do we take care of the, the situation as of right now? Um, also, we want to start to prepare for our future needs. Um, as we've talked about all year long, we are priding ourselves in really keeping our students in district uh, when it comes for specialized programs. And as I had said before, those specialized programs do uh, require more space. So we wanna see as we have more students that are remaining in district, district how do we account for um, the space that, that is required for that? Um, and then one thing when we were doing the um, McKibben's uh, demographics uh, work, uh, we had, it was, projected that we would see a decline of students, which would help us kind of push off the potential space needs in the immediate future. However, uh, we are, per their projections, there would be an increase of students um, in 2029 to 2030. Um, and, and you're probably asking, well, why are we, why are we um, seeing a decline of students? And, and for the short answer, it's tied to birth rates. Uh, we're seeing lower than, lower than previous numbers in birth rates. Um, however, uh, which we probably have all heard of, pandemic babies, they're <laughs> gonna be coming around the corner in, in five years, which will be you know, 2028 or 2027, 2028, they're gonna be going to the schools and we're gonna need that space at that point. Um, and we're already seeing some of the increase, um, especially in ECDC, which, we, which I'll talk about um, later on in the slides. So, how did we get here? Um, we've met uh, three times so far since um, the, the committee was established, uh, March 29th, May 10th, and then June 6th. And during this time, uh, we've worked with central office to really identify key data points to help us get a sense of where we're at. Um, this, this covered things such as um, enrollment, um, capital expenditures that will be um, seeing in the next, you know, up to 10 years, um, district maps, um, school bus time pickups, um, really a wide variety of data, um, assessments of the various buildings and, and needs, such as um, what we need for space for specialized programs. Um, and then even, uh, which, which wasn't tied to this, but happened which was great um the site visits as well um i thought that was really beneficial to help us get a sense of okay what is this, what are we seeing on paper and how does it actually match up to reality so um i think that was really beneficial and in, in, in helping us tell the story for all of you tonight so tonight as i said we'll review the data with the school committee uh, give you a sense of what we found um, we, the, the next thing we would like to do and really talk about is um, securing a, a, a consultant for a redistrict analysis and, and really taking the next step further. Um, but then also partnering with the community to get their involvement so that we do have a redistricting advisory committee so that it's not a, um, something that just within a silo with the school committee or the um, central office, we, we do have some input from various folks from various uh, areas. So uh, moving on to the next slide real quick. Wanted to first talk about some external factors. And I think this is something that our residents think of all the time, especially where we've seen a lot of development in Franklin in the, the past few years um, in terms of apartment buildings, uh, new, new single family homes, various things that, that would, impact our um, school population. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, from, from a home sales perspective, just to give a comparison between last year and this year, um, we're, while we're slightly higher than last year, um, we, we're not seeing that this volume is actually going to be attributing to a high um, increase in, in uh, uh, school population. Um, when we looked at the the work that the demographers have done previously, um, they were really very, very accurate. Um, we saw that there was a four student differential. So um, gives a very good level of confidence that what they've provided us from their projections look to be accurate. And uh, we should be able to 
move forward and, and use that as a good baseline as what's moving forward and in terms of the, the increase or, or decreases. From a project standpoint, um, currently there's about nine projects that are happening in the town uh, across different levels. Some are um, in early conception, some are further along, um, but what we're seeing for the most part that they're the two, three bedroom apartments or condos and, and historically, uh, from a population standpoint, a, a student increase, um, it's been a, a low yield of students. So um, although we do have some projects happening, it's not something that's going to be a huge driver of uh, increase or decrease of students. Right. Holistically, if you look at the, the district, um, we do have 10 sites um, across the board, starting at our, our youngest level, which, which is at the ECDC, where we have one site, we have currently five middle, five elementary schools, three middle schools, and then that one high school. Um, <clears throat> they all follow really what we're trying to embody in the portrait of the graduate, as you can see in the graph <clears throat> or in the image. Um, just the various um, elements that we would want our, our students to embody um, throughout. <clears throat> so that we want them to embody. Um, what we've seen from this year's enrollment, um, we're uh, as of the beginning of this year um, up to, which was uh, as of October 14th, uh, we're at about a little over 4,700 students. Um, since then, with the movement and folks moving in and just shifting around, we're at a little over 4,800. Um, so, <clears throat> A little over 50 so or a little under 50 students at this point um, but with that increase we are still seeing a, a decrease from last year so um, as of may 20 may of this year about 0.6 percent decreased um, so it so it is going down as our um, projections had said um, but it is higher than we started this year at the beginning of the year throughout the district uh, we do have seven different specialized programs that cater to uh, various students with different abilities, um, starting at the lowest level at ECDC with our integrated pre-K. Pre um, and then we do also have goals, ideas, reach, strive, um, our fifth year transition program in high school. Um, and we do have plans to add two more new programs next year, uh, which are Bright and the NEC partner uh, classroom. Um, Paul, do you want to just kind of talk a little bit about those for me? Sure. Um, so as I've said in um, previous presentations, those are our specialized programs with students with special needs who have um, specific programming needs and need a more smaller classroom size with, with specific methodologies being used. Um, goals is for our students with autism, ideas is uh, language-based disabilities, um, reach is for our students with social emotional challenges, strive is for our students with intellectual and developmental delays. Um, our fifth year transition program are for our high school students who need that extra year um, to develop those um, transition skills to be successful either in, in jobs or in um, college. Um, and as Al mentioned, uh, we're opening a Bright program, which is a program um, we're going to start at the high school in September, a program for students who are transitioning back from hospitalizations or may have concussions or may have school um, challenges with school avoidance. Um, and we're also going to add a net partner program um, at the middle school level because we have current fifth graders who are uh, transitioning to middle school next year. Thank you. Um, and as you can see with our integrated uh, our unified sports program, these, these programs allow our all of our kids to be together and versus separate and it really just helps build a better community. Um, one of the things that you'll we'll, we'll see in the upcoming slides, um, not all of these schools have every one of these programs. So we'll, we'll talk about which ones has have which, um, and we'll, we'll see that called out. Um, on the next slide, uh, really quick, cute image. Uh, we have the logo of all of our schools. And, and really this, this really just shows the, the unique um, culture and spirit of each of the schools and really uh, what they're, they're striving to. Um, but the, the great part of, of Franklin is, while they're all separate, they all then come together. You know, uh, we have our students in ECDC that can go to any of the elementary schools. We have the elementary schools feeding into the uh, Horace Mann, um, <coughs> Annie Sullivan, or Remington. Um, um, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, Remington. Um, but then ultimately everything culminates into the high school. We're really bringing everybody together and it really just taking that culture and energy and spirit 
um, as individuals up to collectively into the high school, really where they come together and, and show what all of Franklin means. Um, so uh, really nice representation. What you'll see on the next slide though, and I'm not sure if folks are familiar with this, but these are the, the district maps. Um, I think this is something that I looked at and really had my head scratching a lot, uh, many a times just looking at this and trying to really understand and rationalize it. Um, when you do look at your deck, um, the Franklin district map header is a clickable link and it takes you to the, um, the town website where it really has some really great details around each of the schools, the maps, and it really will let you zoom into the, the maps for every the various sections. Um, but one thing that you notice is that for the most part um, in the elementary side, um, the various schools are, are kind of blocked into their various sections. You have um, <coughs> Jefferson uh, or JFK up in the top left. You have um, um, Remington or I can't even see right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> Jefferson on the, the bottom left. You have Parmenter on the right. You have Keller, uh, which is purple in the top right. And, and you can see um, as remnants of the transition from Davis there to Keller, that's a, a kind of a segmented area where, where we do have students that maybe in uh, the former DT district area um, that are traveling across um, the Oak Street in um, Horseman area just to get to, to Keller. Um, one thing that you also notice about Oak Street and Horseman, um, this one actually spans Franklin east to west. Um, so you do have students that could reside um, at either ends of Franklin transitioning into the center of Franklin, we'll say, um, to, to go to that, that school. But as I had said before, each of these schools do feed up into their respective middle schools. And as you'll see, um, the, the only difference at that point is that the, the mapping has um, combined the, the multiple areas to, to represent that one middle school. All right. Next slide. Um, so going forward, we're going to just really talk through each of the slides um, individually and really what are the things that we found about that particular facility. Um, so you just get a sense of what we, what we saw. Um, the format looks very, very similar. Where we'll see um, just a, a profile on the right hand side. Uh, but just a little bit about ECDC for those that are not necessarily familiar with ECDC as much. Um, so this is an integrated preschool uh, for all of our Franklin residents that are aged three to five. Um, and it's for all of uh, all abilities. Uh, the classrooms are, are, are mixed. So it, we're not segregating children based off their ability. Um, they are working together, learning together, um, understanding each other, and, and really um, partnering together so that they can grow even fur further and be more uh, accepting of one another. Um, unlike the other Franklin schools, this school does have a tuition. Um, so there, it does range anywhere from 2,200 a year up to 6,300 a year. Um, so it, it is not your traditional uh, public school where you're just, you're just going there. There is a tuition that, that is paid. Um, families do have to apply to the school as well. Um, and there, there is a lottery um, in February as well. The one difference though, um, compared to regular schools where you start in September and you, you go through July or June, is that um, the enrollment is based off of when the child turns three. So um, while we do have children that will start in September, throughout the year, there will be more addition of children as they go, just because they are aging into the program. Um, and then once they do turn five, um, they would start school in September um, in normal kind of, in the kindergarten program. Um, one of the things that we'll see in this is that all the classrooms all have sinks and toilets as well. Um, that's just one of the, the requirements to really be supportive of that environment. So talking through some of the numbers real quick, um, when we looked at fiscal year 22, uh, they start off with 130 year, 30 students in the, um, in the program, um, nine classrooms in, in total. And then we had various specialized rooms. Um, one was a calm room. We had a motor room and also a conference room. Um, in our trip to ECDC, that facility was bursting at the gills. Um, the teachers were, were making space to support the kids and really sacrificing their own um, 
workspace to make sure that the kids have what they needed to, to, to really be successful and, and really be supportive. Um, it, it was really a testament to see really their focus was, was on the children and, and not necessarily with themselves. Um, and so it was great to hear. Um, but as you can see in fiscal year 23, um, we're increasing by 35%, uh, going up to 175 students. Um, and at that point, as I said, they were already at, it was a high capacity um, and, and low space for the teachers. Um, however, um, we're, we're going up to anywhere from 10 to 11 classrooms if need be, uh, that one calm room, that one mode room. And as you can notice, um, that conference room that they've had for themselves and has, has to be moved or has to be cared for some, in some other way. So it's just something to be mindful of when thinking through um, what's the situation at the ECDC and what they need for from a space standpoint. All right. So that's ECDC. Um, moving on to the elementary schools, as you'll see here, um, once again, our map and just kind of the, the layout of where, where the schools are in the various districts. So we'll start off with Parmenter. And um, <clears throat> Some just facts about the building. Um, so for those that don't know, it was built in 1951. Um, it was renovated in 1988 where an addition was added. Um, I think they really did a really great job. Um, when we went out there to do the, the site visit, it was unless they, until they told me which side was the addition and which wasn't, you, you weren't able to tell. Um, they, they really made it cohesive and really um, continuous that it was, it felt like one great space. Um, from a functionality standpoint, um, it's deemed to hit 384 um, students, but this is based off of um, just um, space numbers that, that may, may have changed. So um, while we do say 384, it, it could be a little bit less and varied. Um, what we're seeing though from enrollment at this right now, about 302 students in, in, in the facility as of the, the beginning of the year. Or as of as of May, sorry, um, this is down from last year or of 2020. So 11 percentage points down. So right now we're um, about 79 percent utilization, whereas previously we we're at um, at 90 90 percent. Um, so it has gone down, and just to do just various factors. Um, Parmenter does have neck. Um, the next program in that facility where they, they currently are expecting to have five students of next year. Um, we were, and that's one thing I missed on the other slide. Uh, we are making significant investments in our town, um, in our schools, in our facilities. And just, Mr. Gary, we'll go, go back, back a couple. Um, one of the things that we're doing um, just for the next two fiscal years, uh, and actually to the district profile. Yep, thank you. Um, we're, we're spending in just in two years, or at least projecting to spend at least $3.9 million on, on various facility needs. Um, and these could be anywhere from replacing a roof, updating the boiler, um, updating a playground, just various things. So we, we do know that there is um, dollars that we need to spend um, to just really make sure that our, our facilities are up to, up to date and um, we're not lacking in any, any way, shape or form. All right, but back to Parmenter. Um, for them, um, in the next two years, we're looking about uh, 700,000 at that point. And as you can see, it's for our, our boiler and a playground. So um, there are things that we, we do have on our radar that we're going to do. Um, this is just the next two years, but we do have a 10 year projection. Um, but as we go further out, the dollars may, may change based off of just uh, various costs. Um, one thing just to call up before we switch slides um, is the utilization. When we worked with McKibbins and KBA, um, they gave their perspective around what is an ideal utilization percentage. Um, and, and really the, the goal was to, to not necessarily exceed that percentage. So, um, so where we see 79% for, for Parmenter, it's, it's lower than the projection. Doesn't mean it's bad, it's, it's, it's we're, in a, we're in a good shape and it uh, at least gives us some flexibility um, if the definition of what capacity is um, varies. So moving on to Keller. Um, so this is our 
newest facility. Um, so built in 2002, as I mentioned, um, the functional capacity of this is 536. And as a result of the, the combination of the two, uh, two schools, uh, this year we were at uh, 553. Um, so we, we are higher than capacity. Um, and it's about a 38 percentage point increase from 2020. Um, now you, you may all be concerned as well, well, colors at 103%, um, how, are they, how are they really handling the, the space needs and really handling all the students? Um, the great part is, is that we do have great leadership at Annie Solomon and Keller, and they, them and also the other middle schools that are conjoined with an elementary school, um, there's really strong partnership to really understand, okay, what are our space needs? And they do flex. So if there's a need for more space and for, for teachers, they'll communicate and make sure that they move things around so that both areas um, are, are have adequate space um, and they're not necessarily suffering or, or jamming all their kids into one small area. Um, so if you look at, at Keller, we'll just say, if you say it's a pie, uh, they might be, Keller might be using 70% of the facility and Annie Sullivan's using the rest um, one year, but if there's less students, they might flex and, and adjust accordingly. So um, there's definitely a lot of communication and, and just partnership between the two leaderships. Um, in Keller, uh, there is Strive, um, and in, in fiscal 23, we're looking to see that there'll be nine students at that point. Um, similar to, to Parmenter, we're a little under um, 700,000, 600, 650,000 for various uh, efforts, um, be it uh, upgrading the fire alarm panel or doing security improvements. Um, and this, this cost covers both Keller and Annie Sullivan. So it's not just one portion, it's, it's the whole, whole building in the entire, entirety. Uh, moving on to Jefferson. Um, Similar to Keller, um, fairly newer building um, in comparison to the others built in 1996 with the capacity of 433 students, um, but currently enrolled 337. Uh, we're at about 78% utilization, which is down from two, 2002 by two percentage points. Um, and then once again, from a specialized program, um, we have goals, uh, which uh, is gonna have 22 students next year and then ideas, which will be looking to have nine students. Um, there, this one here has a, a lot of uh, planned work. As you can see, um, double than what we've seen, or more than double than what we've seen in previous slides, uh, with hitting about 1.6 million. Um, and this ranges from the boiler, the fire alarm panel, uh, an update to the basketball or playground, um, and then just other security improvements. Um, so um, just things to be mindful of. Um, that although it's it's newer, there's still there's still regular work that needs to be done on the various sites. At Kennedy, um, built in 1964, um, renovated back in 1999, and, and this is when we had added um, the modulars. So, um, if you're not familiar with the building, um, adjoining the cafeteria or not the cafeteria, adjoining the um the gymnasium there's there are modular um classrooms that are there that i believe there's four is that correct dr modular classrooms yeah. or three three thank you um but four. they're they're just four. addition oh okay four thank you i was like okay. <laughs> they're they're used for various things um I believe there was health in there uh music and it I forget what the other two were, but uh, these are just rooms for extra space that the school uh, students can use uh, for various things. Um, for right now, we're looking at, from a capacity standpoint, about 443 students. Um, however, we're, we're at 342 as of May of this year. Um, it is down two percentage points from 2020, so we're about 77%. And from a specialized program, we do have NEC there as well, which, which has three students. Um, one of the things that I've, I've noticed with, with um, Kennedy, which is different than the other, other classrooms, um, probably one of the things that, that's a little unique, um, when you look at like the gymnasium or the cafeteria, um, they actually have classrooms that are abutting 
those those rooms. Um, so there's actually entrances in and out um, from the from the cafeteria where and the gym, which is a little bit different in the other schools. Um, as far as from a maintenance standpoint, um, probably one of the least um, costly maintenance programs. So we're looking at about 150,000 uh, just from a security improvement standpoint. Uh, Oak Street. Um, so you see built in 1964, uh, last renovated in 1999. Uh, capacity is at 515 with the enrollment currently at 382. This one actually, well, I think this is probably the, uh, one of the few exceptions, um, but their utilization has increased from 2020, um, going from 70% to 74% this year. Um, and then we do have uh, REACH, which is in this per building as well with um, nine students in, as of 2023. Um, but one thing that's a little bit unique is that they do have lifelong learning office space here. Um, so it's not necessarily the classrooms, but it's just the, the administration um, currently has some space in this, with this building as well. Um, so they're, they're sharing that, that space um, for, the, for, their, for their purposes. Um, from a maintenance standpoint, as you can see, we do have uh, work on the fire alarm panel, uh, which has been something that needs to be done on a lot of the different schools. Um, but just like the other complexes, this work is shared with um, the high school as well. It's not just uh, specific to the, the elementary school. So those are our um, various elementary schools and just kind of the status of them in terms of um, capacity, programs, and, and, and just really upcoming expenses that we should be mindful of. Um, So moving on uh, to middle school. And as I mentioned before, all of the middle schools are fed by the, the, um, the five elementary schools where um, those, those areas are now just feeding into uh, that, that middle school. So we have Oak and Kennedy going into Horace Mann. We have Annie Sel or Keller going into Annie Sullivan. We have Jefferson and Parmenter going into Remington. And as you can see in the map, um, as the color is, uh, is shows uh, those various areas for those, those three middle schools. From an Annie Sullivan standpoint, um, not really going to talk about the um, when it was built, uh, but one thing just, just to, to call out or a couple things to call out, um, our, our utilization is at 46%, which is, is down from 2020. Um, but what you can see is that complex utilization, which is that combined number for um, Andy Sullivan and Keller and, and really where we're at. So um, although we're seeing a low number for the utilization, it's, it's really ideal for the building. And, and as I said before, um, this helps with that flexing across the two facilities or the two, two distinct schools when, when there is a space need. So, um, we do still have those specialized programs. So the Strive students that are in and next students that were in um, Keller would transition into uh, Annie Sullivan. And you can see the, the projected numbers there, um, eight and two respectively. All right, moving on, Horace Mann. Um, same thing, I'll just actually start with the complex utilization. Um, similar to Keller or Annie Sullivan, uh, this one here, we're at 61%. So um, really allowing for that flexing between the two. And I think this is this is one of the things that if, if we if we didn't have this, um, we'd be in a worse space um, so that they, they can make those needs as, as making those moves as needed um, before rather than having to say we, we are at capacity. Um, but all in, all in, um, we're at about 51% utilization for Horace Mann, which is about 12 percentage points down from previous year. So once again, we're, we're seeing that, that trend across the majority of the sites that utilization is going down and, and which I guess is a good news um, in the sense that we're not in a crisis that we have to do something right away. Um, but it's, it's just a lull before we do see that increase. And um, this is the opportunity to really look at what we can do now to prepare for what's to come down the road. Um, but 
because of that space, um, we do have reach um, with that 12 students and then also that opportunity to add um, Bright um, next year as well. Um, and uh, we, we don't know the number of students as of yet. Correct. Right. right. No, no. And probably at the middle school, it won't be right in September. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little more complex to develop a middle school Bright program. Um, so we're working, we're starting the planning stages now. Um, but we don't know the number. It'll be a rolling number mm -hmm. um, because it depends on who's transitioning, who needs it. So. Okay, perfect. Um, and then once again, I'm not going to talk about the maintenance as we talked about it with the other school. Um, but then when we get to Remington, um, and as you can see, once again, we're in a, a good space from a utilization standpoint, complex wide. Um, so it, once again, it's just, it just really comes down to the leadership communicating, working together so that if we do need some um, to flex and move folks around, we can do so and, and really provide um, provide the, um, the students the, the space that they, that they would need. Um, but all in, we're at about 53% utilization, which is once again down from 2020, about three percentage points, um, with giving us at where we're at 381 students. Um, but we do have those two programs, ideas, goals, um, with a total of 21 students across um, added in 2023, so 14 and seven respectively. All right. Um, so those are our elementary schools and it's kind of the state of state of or middle schools and the state of the, those sites. Um, moving on into the high school, a few things just to call out. And, and this is a little different. Um, a lot of the numbers that we, we pulled were from the, the McKimmons assessment. Um, that was done uh, a few years ago, um, and high school was not necessarily included in that. Um, but what we do know um, gives us a sense of where we're at. So um, built in 2014, and it was built for 1650. Um, since it's been built, it's, it's been higher than that number. Um, but as the population has declined and as time has progressed, um, we are getting closer to that 1650 number. Um, as of right now, we're at about 1673. And once again, um, with as we see lower students in the other schools and the middle schools, especially, we're going to see that trickle up or trickle down into in the high school, and, and we're going to get to below that sixteen fifty um, at, at some point um, before we, we do see increases. Um, from a specialized program, there's there's a slew of programs, especially where all the other schools are feeding into the high school. So we do have our REACH program, our STRIVE, um, the 50-year transition program, which I think is phenomenal and it gives students really a great opportunity um, just to, to be prepared for uh, what's to come after the after high school. Um, and then Bright will also be in the high school as well. Um, so you can see with REACH, we're looking at 21 students next year, uh, 17 in STRIVE, five in the 50-year transition program, and then uh, Bright will be to be determined once we get this up and running. Um, but the good news is because we do have a um, brand new school, we're not necessarily spending a lot on maintenance in the sense in the upcoming years. Um, the really the, the big one that's coming up in the next two years is the, the work to um, take care of the bleachers, um, which is about $300,000. Um, so for those that were at the graduation or, 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 or saw it, um, we have our nice home bleachers that look good, uh, but then we have our visitors that that is in, in some need some repair and um, definitely something that's a secret. That's yeah. Al, just to point out as well, those bleachers predate this building. They're original bleachers, so that project is separate from um, the high school when it was built. Just so folks at home don't um, think that, that those were built in 2014. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, um, but yeah, so that's something that that's on the radar and just to to um, have some equity across the board, visitors and home. <laughs> Everyone is welcome at Franklin. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but that's really kind of what we what we found. Um, the the summary of of the the three months or three meetings that we we've, we've met, um, just to give you a sense of where the buildings are. Um, we do have um, the Google Drive that has all of the, the previous uh, space needs meetings from our predecessors and then just kind of the, the data that we've had here that we've just distilled down to what's in this deck for you. Um, so 
talking about just recommendations and next steps. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, just securing a, a consultant for dis redistricting anal analysis. Um, this is bigger than the school committee. I think we need some expertise outside of us um, just to look at it um, objectively um, and look at the various options to see, well, what can we do um, and what, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? And really just give us a, a menu to choose from um, to really care for what will happen help us over the next you know 10 plus years um, especially anticipating that we're going to see that decline we're going to see a, a rebound um, and just to be prepared so that we're not kind of caught um, caught off guard um, as i had said also before um, i don't want us to do this alone um, this needs community involvement from from the get-go um, so at least my, my, my thoughts are that we, we do have representation from faculty, um, some parents, central office and the school committee, um, just to be able to talk it through. Um, as we establish this advisory committee, we'll talk through literally what's the roles and responsibilities um, and, and really um, what the expectations are. Um, so that's something I wanna make sure that folks are part of this and we're all coming along together as a, as a team. Um, to get to a, a, a defined end goal that we all agree to is this is what we want to see. Um, the consultant will help us figure out how to get there. Um, I threw a just a, a really just a, a potential timeline just to get something for folks to react to to see one does this make sense and it's reasonable. Um, looking at it, so we we're talking about this now. Um, want to mention really start by beginning that process to find that consultant. So following this meeting, um, really begin that step to figure out, oh, who are we gonna reach out to? Who are we gonna partner with? What are, what's the potential cost? Um, and do about all of our fact finding to um, be able to, at the end of the day, um, secure who we'll, we'll work with to, to move forward. Um, by September of this year, um, securing that person that will be partnering with this work. Um, also in September of this year, um, really reaching out to the community to, to figure out who would be interested in this um, and then helping and then establishing that advisory committee um, so that we can really begin this cohesive work to, to make sure that we do hear voices from all, all impacted groups. Um, from there, we work with that consultant to do all the analysis and feedback and, and ultimately um, in March of 23, at that point, um, we'd have something um, prepared and packaged up to bring back to the school committee to say these are our options A, B, C, and D. Um, and by by April, we choose to um, which proposal that we would want to do, and 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 then talk about okay, well, what does that time frame look like um, at that point? Um, and this is not necessarily limited just to just changing the way the pie is cut. Um, I mean, I think we, we, we talk to the consultant and see what are all of our options um, and what makes sense for the longevity um, and not necessarily just what's happening for the short term. Um, but at the same time, making sure that those options are transparent, it, it aligns with what our, our true end goals are um, and then we, so we can move forward. Um, and then next also just really talking about um, ECDC, as I, as I mentioned, we're seeing that 35% increase. So is this a, a blip? Is this the beginning of the increase that we'll see that will bubble up into the elementary schools? Um, so how do we make sure that our, our youngest uh, stakeholders are, are cared for and they have what they need to be successful? Um, and same for the folks that are, are leading them and molding their, their education. Um, and then also just looking at what are our long-term needs for any new facilities. Um, I know we've, we've closed Davis there um, because it, due to just not being able to support our growing needs. Um, do we need to look at all of our, any of our other sites to see, well, are there things that are, are lacking and, and do we need to build a new facility to, to uh, address any of these concerns. So just really putting all options at the table, um, not saying that we'll do anything, but it's just it's just looking to see what makes sense and is it right, is it not? And in, in, in essence, brainstorming before we just rule things out right off the bat. Um, so 
that is it. Um, any questions at this point? Oh, Dr. Hearn? Can I jump in with a few points of emphasis, if you don't mind? Um, sure. Al, you did a phenomenal job capturing a, a tremendous amount of information that was shared with the Space Needs Subcommittee and really synthesized it into, I think, the most salient points. Um, there's a couple of um, just uh, points of emphasis that I would want to make um, for people, especially who are watching at home or may watch this um, as it's recorded. Uh, I think that the numbers betray this uh, impression that there's um, a lot of space uh, with like 40 46% space utilization, some of the middle schools, and I appreciate the focus on the complexes. Um, this analysis was done based on pre-pandemic standards, and I would want to um, really circle back and emphasize that um, based on what the Massachusetts School Building Authority had kind of set as the standard, as the building standard. Um, I think we're all using space differently and distancing ourselves kind of naturally from people um, post-pandemic. Uh, we also have an increased number of small group uh, instructional staff, whether it's interventionists or counselors, um, special educators, um, really working um, more, I mean, special educators push into the classroom too and do a lot of co-teaching, but there's more small group instruction. And so, um, so that's not necessarily reflected in the MSBA um, standards. So I think um, you know the point around we're not in a crisis situation. We don't have to do something is is very accurate. Um, but just for folks watching at home, I want to kind of paint a picture that we're not talking about twenty four students in rows in classrooms, uh, you know, all next to each other down the down the hallway. Um, that it's a much more dynamic picture, and there's a lot of movement, small group instruction, um, students uh, moving around with different adults in the building uh, to support a more diverse set of student needs. Um, the KBA assessment also um, took into consideration the specialized programs, but at that point in time, the specialized programs two, three years ago, this would, would have been 2019, were smaller. Um, we've expanded into additional classrooms since then. And so again, um, we're not, uh, we're not, um, we're not in a crisis situation by any stretch. Um, and there may be some things that can be done uh, to, to use space a little bit more efficiently. Um, but I think that the specialized programs, um, again, the numbers are you know, based on the, the, the standard that we have as a tool to work with, um, but in reality, it plays out just a little bit differently. And then um, the other thing, and, and I'll hit upon this too, um, the maintenance figures uh, come from the um, kind of 10 year lookout that Mike D'Angelo puts together for facilities. And um, I would just say, um, while those are kind of the expected projects, there are a lot of things that can happen, whether it's um, funding and revenue sources that are available, uh, the capacity of the facilities department, the uh, availability at this point of um, of uh, materials through supply chain issues that some of those projects, just because they're listed, they're pretty variable and may, uh, may shift uh, in terms of time frame. but it does give you kind of a window into what those big projects are for each of the buildings and each of the complexes. Um, and so thank you for just letting me add a few, a few points of clarification thank you. or emphasis, not clarification, mm -hmm. emphasis. Thank you both. Okay, any questions, Dave Callahan? Yeah, um, Al, thank you uh, so much. It was incredibly informative. Uh, was missing some comfort dogs, but otherwise it was <laughs> spectacular. <laughs> uh, I, I, got a, I got a couple of different bullets. You just want me to throw one out and then kind of yield my time and, and circle back? Oh, um, no, I think you can do, just do it. Just throw it all out? Okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, it, it, to whomever. Um, one of the things you had mentioned was talking about uh, space utilization. You know, as we really kind of saw at uh, doing like the site visits, uh, there are some like, you know, like the high school, I still remember, it has this, had that amazing room with like the glass uh, doors and uh, uh, whiteboards on all the walls. When we're looking to the future, how do we anticipate some future utilizations? 
um, you know, it's easy to kind of look at it and say like, well, you know, right now we need like a room for Chromebooks. But as we start to kind of build stuff, how do we kind of think about, well, what might students use in 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. But would that just be something that we want to make sure that we kind of have like a consultors, uh, consulting team? I think it's a great, I think it's a great question um, in terms of kind of visioning. Um, as you talk about the portrait of a graduate, there's the curriculum um, that you would seek to align, but then, you know, what, and that's going to involve resources, including staffing, as well as including space. And so, um, you know, I think that that's, uh, I think, you know, the redistricting analysis would kind of strictly be numbers in terms of trying to balance out uh, and make the map uh, a little bit more efficient. Um, but, you know, there's a visioning piece around how you, and, you know, and a new superintendent coming in, um, strategic planning, uh, working with the school committee and the school community could kind of check in on that and, and do some visioning. Um, and then you could align your plan accordingly. Thank you, Barb. Um, and then uh, something else when you talked about the the in district specialized programs, um, you know obviously that is something that's that's fantastic. Um, there was there was a video talking about the unified basketball team, in which they, they specifically kind of mentioned uh, some of the family members kind of coming to Franklin, hearing about some of the programs that we have to offer. Um, you know, you said it was you know it's something prideful, and it definitely is. And but not to be cold, but it also is a, is a bottom line in there too. And I think that's something for the community to kind of understand that there's also a lot of cost savings by being able to, to have these programs and keep them in the district um, versus um, you know, kind of going out. But um, in terms of the specialized programs, one of the things I saw is at the elementary school level, and I know that each program services different needs um, and, and different children, but uh, most of the elementary school, uh, elementary schools, when we talk about like the student population in those specialized ones, it was kind of within single digits. Uh, and then over at Jefferson, I think it was about like almost 30 or above 30. Is there, is that something that we need to look at in terms of balancing out uh, some of the specialized programs across the rest of the district? Yes, I mean, you need to look at space, but you also need to look, what's tough too is that um, as a kid, if you have, say you put some classrooms at Jefferson and some classrooms at Kennedy, we'll just give that for example. So that, that means there's more transitions for students because if you do it by grade level, um, you know, they get, once they get to third grade, we're gonna transition you to Kennedy and you're gonna have a, you know, you're gonna do fourth and fifth grade at Kennedy. So that, that's one option that you look at and you, and you wanna be careful with that. Um, another idea we've talked about is maybe we need to put one classroom, a goals classroom at Kennedy and a goals classroom at, at Jefferson. And then, you know, students, certain students in that maybe middle school or middle school area will go to Kennedy. The others will go to Jefferson and divide it up but that way where we put programs, program classrooms in each, in each building. So there's different ways we can look at it. Um, but, you know, um, you know, Sarah and I have been talking about that. Yes, our, we have great to have these specialized programs, but sometimes it comes to a cost to the amount of um, the capacity of the administrative staff as well as the related service providers and, and the amount of staff that you need and, and, and the impact on the building. So you have to kind of balance all of those things. But yes, we are looking at projections on how our programs are growing. Um, you know, I, I will be honest, the goals program is probably the one that's growing the quickest right now, the fastest with more students being identified with autism and needing that smaller space. Um, but I also am hopeful that once we um, continue to establish our MTSS systems of tier one and two supports and programming, that we will be able to keep more kids within the generalized general classroom with some related service and pullout supports and they might, might not need the program. So we're kind of looking at that whole big picture of special education um, in the district and programming in the district and how to best meet the needs of students. Okay, thank you. That's, that was a very long-winded response. No, I, but I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Two others to show you. Okay, all right. Um, on actually, the, the, in terms of the, the specialized mm -hmm. uh, projects, uh, uh, programs, talking about like the Bright. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's not like the Bright at the, the middle school was over at Horace Man. Correct. Uh, projected. So, would that mean that, um, and this is something for someone who might be like returning from hospitalization, that a student at, say, like Remington goes to, you know, is, is hospitalized? 
comes to return and then would be sent, sent, but then would go to Horace Mann, then to be transitioned back into Remington. Is that correct? So that's the complexity of a middle school program, the way we're, we're budgeted for, because we only budgeted for one bright classroom at the middle school level. So that, that that's kind of the logistical pieces that we're working on with, with the people from Bright on how to best um, establish that program because um, in theory yes that's what it would be but is that best for students so that's what we need to look at so um, that's why it, it won't be up and running for september it's going to take us some time to really um, coordinate with with the bright program that's the powers that be at bright um the consultants for bright to help us develop that program a little bit further um, so we're looking at different creative options um you know in brookline did have that model um they found some challenges with that model so we're looking to other districts to see how what their middle school model looks like Okay, thanks. Because yeah, I could I could imagine that that's would just be difficult for the student exactly. kind of being bounced from exactly because you want that fluidity where that educational coach is, is you know communicating with the gen ed teachers and and slowly into reintegrating the student back into their classroom. So it would be more challenging if the student was at Forest Man, but then really it takes Remington to do that. So we're we're looking at different ways to to create that. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Um, and then uh, last one, this one might be more for Miriam. So looking at like the scheduled maintenance, it seems like it's going to account for about like two and a half percent of at least of, of today's budget. Um, is that kind of in line with historically how much we've spent on scheduled maintenance? Do you, so, and, so the maintenance um, and facilities budget runs through the town um, and a lot of the maintenance that you heard about tonight is um, coming from our capital plan, uh, as well as the borrowing authorization. Uh, and, and that's a little bit more, like we haven't seen the borrowing authorization happen in past years, so that's new. Um, and, and new money that the town is borrowing for with their new AAA bond rating. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, um, uh, so that's new money that that has come in or that will come in to support those maintenance projects. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for the clarification. Right. Yield my time. Great job. No, okay. no questions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. Okay, Dave McNeil. Yes, uh, thank you, Al. Um, and yeah, and thank all members of the, um, the subcommittee. It was very informative for your presentation. You had some tough acts to follow. I did. But uh, you, were, you were definitely in the top three presentations. <laughs> oh. Good job. Good job. Um, yeah, I, um, I think this timeline, um, I think this timeline is, is great. I look forward to um, seeing the results. Um, all and while exploring the, the consultant, because I mean, we can you know, take a look at all the different, um, you know, like different maps and capacity percentages, and we can all, I'm sure we can all come up with all sorts of speculation. But you know, until we kind of ask like the consultants and kind of do get some informed research, I think that's the that's the best way to go about it. So I think, and this is, um, and yeah, having results by next spring, I think that's um, that that's great. So yeah, thank you for that. I think that's that's an excellent approach. Um, you mentioned, you know, back in you know, 2002, the last time that we did um, redistricting, we were, uh, Franklin was more of a growing community and it's not quite the same now. Um, do you or do, do any of us, do we have like maybe some more like comparison data from 2002 to now that like we can maybe shed some light on where we are now based on what happened then? I have some um, enrollment information that I can share with you related to 2002. Sure, thank um, you. I didn't necessarily look at the facilities and the and the layout, um, but I think you know how it was structured and kind of set up for students to flow through the district. Um, in 2002, we had 5,609 students on the October 1 enrollment report. And at that time it was climbing. Um, and projected to increase. We had a high of 6,255 students in 2009, and then it's been decreasing since. Um, so that's kind of the overall population. Um, the other statistic that I thought was really important um, as it relates to this conversation, particularly as we think about our specialized programs, is the increase in the percentage of students with disabilities. Um, so for both Franklin and for the state, um, the percentage of students with disabilities has increased. In 2002, it was about 13% and in Franklin, and it is now 18.4%. In 
and um, the state increased from 15% to 19% roughly. Um, so I just, I think it portrays um, what we know around um, expanding neurodiversity uh, among our student population. And um, so we're kind of tracking with the similar trend that is happening uh, across the state. So in kind of big picture terms, those are some of the numbers, um, but I think education looks very different 20 years later. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, when I was talking about 24 students in a classroom, you know, in rows, it might, the images in my mind were from much longer ago, um, but, you know, even 20 years, I think a lot has changed in the field of education. Thank you, appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I was also curious about um, the, the specialized programs, but uh, Dave's question touched upon that. So yeah, thank you for, uh, for that, Paula. Yeah. Good to you, Mark. There you go. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Charles, for that presentation. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it'll it'll be great to you know analyze the data, look at trends, have those experts you know weigh in, uh, all the stakeholders involved, and make you know a uh, educated you know, decision on the actions you know, we need to take in the future. Great, thank you, Camille Bernstein. Um, thanks for the methodical and also um, long-term view. I know that this will be done in a thorough, methodical manner. Um, it does, um, it's not too early though to um, frame people's expectations and to remind parents that should there be a change in the future, far in the future, that um, the way you frame it to your children can really make an effect on their experience should they have to go to a different school. We have excellent schools um, and very often um, uh, kids pick up on stress and anxiety and parents um, sometimes can um, be stressed and anxious about what their child might feel and then the child thinks they should feel that and then it, it just becomes this terrible feedback loop so i don't think it's although we're taking our time with this i don't think it's too early to remind parents that your attitude and your openness and your willingness for information and also to um, reframe for your child about the positives um, because um, I would be happy to send my children to any of the schools in the district. Um, and um, certainly we move to neighborhoods or we move to a town and we might have older children who have a certain experience, but that doesn't mean um, following whatever might happen that um, your subsequent children couldn't have just as good an experience. So I, I, I will probably say this over and over and over and over and over every time there is mention of the space committee. So thank you. That's important though, important reminder. And I'm also glad that a couple of you echoed the word redistricting because I think it's important um, for us to understand that, um, that that's a big piece of what the study is going to be. And so I know that can be a, a scary word and it brings up all sorts of anxieties. And I'm a mom of two kids in the Franklin Public Schools and I hear you and I feel you. Um, but I, I take comfort in your words, Lady Bernstein. So if you would keep, <laughs> her, keep repeating them, I think it's, it's important. It's important. Very, very true. Great. So moving on to discussion action items. So um, discussion action items. The first discussion action items is related to facilities. Um, so tonight you've heard a presentation, you know, kind of related to the status of the facilities with, um, you know, some backup information around uh, enrollment, knowing that enrollment's going to decrease over the next three years or so, projected to um, increase, although um, modestly, you know, the projection has doesn't forecast another 6,000 students uh, in Franklin. It you know goes down to about 4,300 and then comes up to about 4,450. So, um, so it's, um, it's a modest increase. Um, we don't know beyond that uh, what may happen. Um, and we do anticipate um, a significant decline at the high school um, as the students make their way through middle school and, and into the high school. So they're not projected to see an increase uh, by 2030. Um, you've seen too that there are some pressure points um, in the district, uh, primarily uh, related to ECDC um, that we're uh, currently looking to problem solve. Um, and so um, 
so the space isn't um, isn't perfect, um, and we do have um, some pressure points, um, but still there's a memo in your packet um, related to uh, Davis there Elementary School. Um, I do, uh, I'm not gonna read the entire memo, but I do wanna take a moment um, to commend the administration, faculty and staff, families and students for their work this year. Um, I think it's important to recognize all that has gone into uh, developing a unified culture at Keller, Keller Elementary School. Um, I keep on hearing it comes up over and over again uh, about the core values and how um, Davis Thayer's core values have been uh, integrated into the school. Um, that is a um, data point that I, I actually have had people echo, uh, echo a few times. And, but I know it's not been easy, um, but everybody's been focused on the kids and has um, the students' uh, best interests in mind. Uh, as it relates to the Davis Thayer facility, I've done two updates in superintendent's reports, one in January and one in April, um, kind of indicating to the committee and community where we are. Um, in the fall, uh, we identified items to repurpose throughout the district. Uh, this included classroom desks and tables, office furniture and chairs, and other instructional materials. Um, throughout the year and uh, to this date, the building is in use providing storage um, it has been holding some of our furniture. As you know, we've had um, cafeteria spaces set up with desks, and so our tables were in storage. Um, fortunately, we have not had to pay for uh, additional storage units offsite, like some districts have had to during COVID. Um, and so we've been using it as a, as a place to um, move to furniture to and from as we um, kind of return our physical spaces back to a more normal setup um, in, our, in our schools post-COVID. Um, the Davis Thayer Elementary School is also where the district and the town is storing PPE, uh, primarily hand sanitizer and masks um, are being stored at Davis Thayer. Um, so the building's being maintained by the facilities department within the facilities budget, which as Miriam had talked about, um, is kind of accounted for uh, within the town's municipal budget, um, but at a lower cost compared to normal operations, as you might imagine. Um, through this process, we wanted to make sure that we were above board with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Um, they have a provision regarding notification. Um, you know, they want to be involved in the process. They don't want districts, although it's a local decision, um, they don't want districts to, you know, dispose of a school property uh, and then come looking for an MSBA loan uh, later down the line, um, but not um, necessarily have thought of the ramifications if that school property could then be turned around and used uh, again as a school. Um, they also have uh, invested in school properties. Um, and so if they had invested in a school, they would want to recoup some of their some of their money back. Um, they have not invested in the Davis Thayer Elementary School, so the financial piece isn't an issue. Um, but I did not want to put the district in a difficult spot with MSBA um, by not following a process and then have them come back and say, uh, and jeopardize a potential future building project, which you may want to consider um, a new school, a new elementary school was uh, proposed from Castle Booz in relationship to the Kennedy School, which is one of the older, um, uh, one of the older schools. Um, although it's been uh, and had some renovations, it is um, kind of one of the older buildings. Um, the MSBA has been responsive um, after, uh, after our outreach to them and has indicated that we've met their notification requirements. Um, so you've seen the um, space needs presentation tonight. And although there are some places in the district uh, where there are pressure points, primarily at ECDC at the current moment, um, you know, our team, um, you know, for all of the reasons um, that we had um, heard from uh, the architects related to Davis there as um, a space for teaching and learning, uh, you don't feel that the school um, meets contemporary instructional standards. Um, and there are also concerns related to its uh, lack of ADA compliance and also the physical safety of the facility is not up to contemporary standards. Um, so as such, we don't feel that uh, the Davis Thayer Elementary School would be a viable solution for our current um, pressure points or space concerns. Um, so therefore I recommend uh, to the committee uh, that pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40, 
Section 15A, that the school committee declare that the Davis Bayer Elementary School property is no longer needed for school purposes, and further that the school committee notify the town council of that determination. Is there a motion to declare that the Davis Bayer Elementary School property is no longer needed for school purposes, and that we will notify the town council of that determination as discussed? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? No, I do just want to mention that this uh, all school committee members were given an invitation to walk through Davis there in its current in its current um, situation. Uh, some of us were not familiar with the building at all, and some of us were very familiar with the building as a school, but not as what it is currently. Um, and so I appreciate the district um, allowing us that opportunity. So with that, the vote will come on the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Oops. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, the next discussion action item? Yes, the next discussion action item is the superintendent's evaluation. And um, so as you know, the, the superintendent's evaluation, we all compiled our independent data um, and then the superintendent evaluation subcommittee met together to um, average it all out and incorporate all perspectives into a drafted document, which is in your packet. So again, this is just a draft um, until the committee votes on it, and then it will become the final um, evaluation report of the superintendent. So I'm not going to read the entire report, and I know that's sad to everybody here and in Zoomland. Um, I'm just going to read a couple, a couple highlights, um, and then the report is public information for those who want more information. So the um, introduction is a little bit about the process, and then we start talking about our current landscape this past year. This year continued to be a year of unprecedented challenges for students and educators of Franklin and our nation. In some ways, 21-22 was more demanding than the previous year's survival mode because the district had to balance between evolving pandemic mode and getting back to a new normal. In her leadership, Dr. Ahern exhibited the utmost professionalism and high standard of excellence in her administration of the district business. Always prepared, relying on data-based decisions, Dr. Ahern demonstrated thoughtful, methodical, compassionate, and ethical decision-making. So that's part of the introduction, just to get us set up here. Um, looking through the goal ratings, we see that out of the performance goals, six performance goals, uh, five of them are met. And those goals are the professional practice goal, student learning goal, social emotional well-being of students and staff, engaging and rigorous curriculum, and effective two-way communication to support student learning. One of the goals was rated as significant progress, which is high quality instruction to meet the academic and SEL needs of each learner, um, in part because one, one piece of that hadn't, um, due to the transition superintendents wasn't completed. Out of the focus indicators, four uh, focus indicators were marked as proficient. That's curriculum, instruction, engagement, and shared vision. And two focus indicators were rated as exemplary. That's laws, ethics, and policies, and fiscal systems. So given those ratings, our overall final composite rating of Dr. Holmes' performance this past year is proficient. And there are a number of uh, commendations in the report. And so since this is Dr. Hearn's final year in Franklin, um, when we move forward, we're, we're really looking at um, looking, pat, looking, giving feedback on this past year, which is important to do, giving, giving feedback um, on her performance thus far. And then when we look at recommendations going forward, we're really not looking at Dr. Hearn as a person, but more as like the district's, um, the district's direction given the performance of Dr. Hearn in the last year. So a couple of the commendations, there's a page and a half, almost two pages. There's many commendations here that um, my colleagues were generous to share. I'll read a couple just to give you an idea. Social emotional learning has clearly been a priority under her tenure. The superintendent led commendable work around SEL related data, assessment, budget items, and communications. 
The superintendent often sent out community-wide emails whenever sensitive events occurred in our community or our country. Often these emails would include resources to help community members in need. Under her leadership, professional development has moved towards more voice and choice with teacher designed and teacher led that honors educators professionalism, differing needs and their skills while providing opportunities for them to be teacher leaders. The superintendent is consistently working towards better and more productive policies while ensuring that all policy revisions are meeting state legal and ethical requirements. Dr. Hearn's presentation at the Joint Budget Subcommittee was an effective start to the budgetary process and led to a smooth budget hearing. The superintendent maintained a consistent focus on the long-term spending of the CARES and ESSER funding. Developing a roadmap of COVID relief funding and priorities was an effective method for ensuring all funds were spent thoughtfully and in a timely manner. As I said, that's just a sampling of the commendations and the rest are in, in the full report. Um, so again, when we look at the areas for continued focus in this evaluation, it's more towards the, with, um, towards the district to keep up, keep up the work that uh, Dr. Hearn has started. I'm gonna read just a couple of those. Um, one recommendation here is to continue to provide opportunities for staff to express views in a safe and open manner with regard to actions that affect them directly or indirectly. Start the process of updating the district's strategy for improvement. Continue to prioritize counselors, social workers, and support staff who interact directly with students, especially as they weather the trauma of the pandemic and the general uncertainty of our country and modern life. Continue the district work of formalizing and rolling out the MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support, including restorative practices. So that's just a little sampling. And then um, just to, to conclude to, um, for the, the, the final summary, I suppose, after five years as superintendent of the Franklin Public Schools, Dr. Hearn is leaving to lead a district closer to home. Under her leadership, the Franklin Public Schools have flourished. She has consistently exhibited courage and aplomb in the face of challenges, and she has always maintained a focus on doing the right thing for our students and our school community as a whole. So, I have language on this. Um, so the acting chair recommends approval of the superintendent's evaluation as discussed. Is there a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, any questions, discussions, any edits? I know you all had the report in your, well, you were on the subcommittee, you know. Um, you had the report in your packet. So as you went through, did you, did you feel like your perspectives were represented and reflected there? Yes, I did. Great, good job, team. Okay, so seeing none, uh, the vote will come on the motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And I always, if I can just jump in for one second and react, um, I want to thank you for all the time that you took individually to put together your individual remarks, as well as what the subcommittee did uh, to synthesize them uh, in a meeting last week to put together the final report. I had the opportunity to sit with Elise uh, a little bit ago and read it before it came out um, publicly and want to thank um, her leadership too, as um, the chair of that subcommittee and putting it together. Um, I've always felt that the feedback that I've gotten has been um, really valuable to me, both personally and professionally, and uh, also uh, does help um, steer the direction of the district. Um, so it's an important process uh, to go through. Um, and as I've said all the time, um, my work uh, happens through and with other people. Um, and it really is, I think, a team evaluation in so many ways, because um, there are uh, folks here in central office, there are leaders in the building and faculty and staff members who are carrying out SEL, who are taking that data, who are leading professional development. And so um, informing policy and working to develop the budget uh, among other things. And so I do uh, have to share this with, um, with the team, uh, the folks sitting here tonight, as well as uh, others uh, in the district. I've always thought that this is something, it's always uncomfortable because um, I think it reflects uh, really uh, the work of so many people. And, um, and I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate your input and your feedback. Um, 
but because this represents the work of so many people, um, I'm so sad to be leaving, but I know that you're in very capable and very good hands um, going forward. And, um, and there's gonna be more great news headlines coming out of Franklin uh, of all the great student outcomes and student achievements. That's true. There will be. I don't doubt it. And next year, the evaluation is going to be so much more robust. <laughs> so much more. <laughs> In good ways. Okay, so next item, um, C, revised FY23 budget. I'm going to turn it over to Miriam. Sure. So you have a member in your packet asking that you uh, approve a revised budget, adding a an allocation of three thousand eight hundred and twenty nine dollars to be allocated to a specialist teacher salary line item at Franklin High School. Um, the reason for this additional allocation is, as you recall, um, you approved a budget back in April um, that was, in fact, three thousand eight hundred and twenty nine dollars less than what the town <laughs> approved after you approved your budget on May 27th. So um, right now the recommendation before you is uh, to approve a budget in the amount of $70,220,825. Is there a motion to approve the revised FY23 budget amount of $70,220,825 as discussed? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? No, seeing none, the vote will come on the motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Meal prices. Next, um, uh, school meal prices. Uh, again, a memo in your packet. I, I, won't, I won't read it for you, um, but I will summarize for the public. The USDA waivers are going away uh, effective June 30th. They will be expiring. Um, the waivers uh, allowed for free lunch for all students. Um, prior to the pandemic, free lunch was only eligible for students who were eligible for free uh, or reduced price meals at, at a reduced price. So uh, in preparation for that, we are um, requesting a, an increase uh, to meal pricing in light of um, increasing meal uh, food costs, increasing maintenance costs, other expenses that are increasing. Uh, the program itself is uh, operates self-sufficiently at this point, needs to operate self-sufficiently. The appropriation budget that you just approved doesn't include any appropriation for food services. Um, the recommended price increase in meals um, is looking at a 50 cent increase across the board for lunch. Uh, and a 20 cent increase in breakfast. Um, the minimum price target that the Department of Ed has set at this point in time is $3.31. Uh, so our um, elementary pricing would go up to $3.25, middle school lunch pricing, uh, elementary lunch that is, uh, middle school lunch pricing would go to $3.50 and high school lunch would be $3.75. Um, and a, um, a breakfast across uh, the district would be $2. So that is the recommendation before you. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Is there a motion to increase the meal prices for the 22-23 school year as detailed? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussions or questions for Miriam? So, uh, yeah, one thing. Um, so with the, with the free lunch going away, um, do we have plans in the district to cascade around how what's the eligibility for these free programs if people aren't aware um just so that they're not caught off guard or just sure. they're eligible and they just don't miss out sure know? so so one thing i did want to add to you is uh to to let you know as well is that there is some discussion at the state level right now to maintain um free lunch um, for students we don't know what that outcome is going to be at this point in time um, the house budget included that the Senate budget does not include that. They are gonna to go to conference. We'll see where it ends up. Um, in the event that, that it does not pass, um, then meals would be at a cost. So parents who are eligible for free or reduced price meals, um, if, if they don't know they're eligible, they can um, apply online uh, or get a paper copy of an application um, that will be out in the middle of August. Um, it looks for household income and household size, 
uh, and there are determination levels um, based on the poverty level. So we will be accepting those applications uh, once the application comes out from the Department of Ed in, um, in the middle of August. Um, and then um, families who might not, not, might not meet the reduced price allocation eligibility um, guidelines uh, have an opportunity for maybe uh, potentially some financial assistance through the school committee policy. Um, uh, I don't know exactly the letters of the policy, but it's on the finance department website. Uh, and the application for free and reduced meals is also on the um, food services website on our district website. Great, thank you, Miriam. Yep, that out? Dave Callahan? Yeah, um, this one's just disappointing that we're kind of having this conversation. The, the free uh, lunches for everybody just level set. Yeah, it, it provided a level playing field. Um, yeah. Suppose for, for um, you know, our civics uh, projects, if there's anybody that, that is interested, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. you know, petitioning out to, uh, to the state house, uh, this would this is a, a spectacular uh, one to, to try to push. Um, and then just to kind of piggyback on uh, Miriam, what you're talking about with the, the free and reduced uh, lunches, I think that, um, and please kind of correct me if I'm wrong or, or elaborate, but uh, when we were doing the site visit, this was a conversation that kind of came up and uh, the schools, the, the admin, uh, the, the um, lunch service uh, you know, employees, everybody does a great job of making it a very discreet um, action uh, that's done. So, um, you know, so the students don't kind of have any stigma attached to it. Uh, so for any, any parents, any families that are in need of some of these services, please, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and uh, again, you know, admin just did a fantastic job of making sure that, um, you know, the students aren't aware of uh, any of the differences. So please don't hesitate to, to reach out and ask for help. Great, thank you. Anybody else? That? Great. So we have a motion and a second. So the vote will come on the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Great. Moving on. Refund of graduating seniors meal balances. So um, as we just heard, mm -hmm. meals were free this year. Um, while we did be continue, while we did begin charging um, for some a la carte items because we were, meals were free this year, um, we uh, seniors did not necessarily have as much opportunity to spend the balances on their account. So um, there are 93 seniors in the district with a positive balance of in excess of ten dollars without a younger sibling. If there was a younger sibling in the household we automatically transferred the funds from the seniors account to the younger sibling. Um, and we are recommending at this point that uh, refunds be issued for those 93 families uh, or, or 93 students, it could be fewer families. Total value of refunds uh, would equate to $3,868 and 50 cents. Um, this would be a waiver to your policy EFD, which was discussed um, at the policy subcommittee meeting as well as the budget subcommittee briefly um, on June 8th and June 9th. Uh, happy to answer any questions. You might have. Great. Is there a motion to make an exception to policy EFD for the school year 21-22 to refund meal account balances over $10 for graduating seniors with no younger siblings as detailed? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions for Miriam? I think it's efficient if you talk about it in the subcommittees first, because then people already know about it. Okay, great. So the vote will come on the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. <coughs> great, so discussion only items. I know it's late, but I'm going to pause our business for a moment for us to pay tribute to Dr. Hearn. As she nears the end of her time with the Franklin Schools, this will be her last school committee meeting with us. I'd like to invite oh. our former school committee chairperson and vice chairperson to come to the front of the room. 
They've been waiting very patiently. <laughs> sit, sit where, where you want to sit. <laughs> sit where you want to sit. You paid your time. Wherever you can you sit wherever you're most comfortable. You can sit with Lucas yeah, if you want. I, I've got to say, Anna and I were chatting back there a little bit. <laughs> oh, we missed this so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's only 10 o'clock. We've got another hour in here. <laughs> um, we're glad to have you back. I, I won't get into it. <laughs> Take the floor. <laughs> Uh, I hope this comes out right. Uh, all right, well, thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts tonight. Uh, it doesn't seem like it was several years ago that I, Ann, and others joined you at your first school committee meeting. And here we are at your last. Oh. It's not a packed house. <laughs> your first one was either. Uh, it has been since. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. now, after watching your interview with the uh, Marshall School Committee, I was reminded why we wanted you to join us here in Franklin. Articulate, intelligent, and passionate about education, thoughtful, kind, and considerate are just some of the things that come to mind. As I mentioned uh, after your selection, as I mentioned to you, it was like, why did it take some, them so long to offer you the position? I, I thought they were going to offer it to you right there on the spot. Uh, I'll never forget the phone call we made to you upstairs in the training room, uh, asking if you would join us as our superintendent. Uh, we were delighted when you said yes. <laughs> we were actually jumping for joy. Uh, and you came on board and quickly owned the position. Was it always perfect? Of course not. Did you do a great job? Of course you did. You took everything in, assessed each situation, and never made decisions blindly, knowing that your decisions could impact every student in the district. And knowing how much you like to take credit, I'd like to give a huge shout out to your admin team <laughs> because you all did it together. From policy to school start times, Davis Fair, uh, to the pandemic, you led with confidence and grace. The pandemic didn't come with a handbook. It was new to all of us. And we just did the best that we could. Thank God it's almost over, maybe. <laughs> While the majority of school committee members were so supportive of you during your tenure, most people don't know of how supportive you were to several of us during extremely difficult situations in our lives. For that, I'll always be grateful and I know others will be too. Uh, well, this is all about you right now, Sarah. I can't miss the chance to congratulate Lucas uh, on his selection as our next superintendent and look forward to your successes, Lucas. Best wishes to you and your family in Barnstable. I, we're also fortunate that you've been our superintendent, Sarah. We'll miss you and our losses, their gain. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. And up next. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thanks for letting me have this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I know Sarah doesn't like it ever to be about her. We know that. Um, she's always the first to point to the team which is true, she is surrounded by incredible people and she is right to recognize them always. It is why she is such a strong leader. It was such an honor to work with Sarah during perhaps one of the most tumultuous times in our history when it would have been easy to sort of raise a finger and check which way the political winds were blowing. Sarah looked to her heart, guided by wisdom, a keen intellect and her compassionate nature knowing it's not possible to please all the people all the time, but it was always with Sarah about doing the right thing. Sarah, we owe you a debt of gratitude. You led us all through the many storms with dignity and grace. You will be missed. We know Lucas will take the wheel and do a great job. You two have supported each other and been a great team. We wish you the very best and know you will continue using your gifts and talents to make a difference in the lives of kids. So thanks, Sarah. We love you. Oh, you too. Thank you.
much appreciated. And your patience is, is yeah. we're very grateful for your patience. This has been a very long meeting. <laughs> um, other committee members, anybody else want to share a few words? I, Dave Callahan, do we? Um, yeah, I, I truly to kind of echo everyone's uh, sentiment. Thank you so much. Uh, for for everything that you've done for the district for for my kids, um, you know you really kind of set us off on a great path forward, uh, and I know that you're going to do tremendous work over in Barnstable. And thank you guys for bringing her to Franklin in the first place yeah. too. I truly <laughs> yes. appreciate that. Very true. Good point, Al Charles. Yeah. Uh, just yes. Thank you for your time. Um, you don't have to be the loudest person in the room to make an impact, mm. and you have been felt everywhere you've gone. Um, behind the scenes, helping the, the central office, helping the, the leaders, of our super, our not super friends, our principals, our our faculty, just really provide the best for our students, and, and we couldn't have done this without you. So, so thank you. And, uh, thank you, Sarah, for your hard work and dedication to our community. We're much better for having had you, and just wish you all the best in this next stage of your life. Thank you. Great. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, and uh, I. Uh, Really like your candor and your professionalism. It's you know the great. I'd like to recognize your um, professionalism as well and your grace and aplomb under pressure. Um, I'd also like to use the word compersion, which is something I only learned a few years ago and is the sympathetic joy for someone else, even when their happiness doesn't benefit you. And I think all of us feel compersion um, for your choice to be closer to home um, and to follow um, your own self-determined path, even if it doesn't benefit us directly. Um, certainly that's uh, made easier with knowing that Lucas will um, follow in your stead, but we're very happy for you. Should have gone before Camille. <laughs> Are you crying? I didn't know I was feeling that. I, know. I didn't have a word for it. I cried like three times. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sarah, the last few years have been a roller coaster a whirlwind, a nightmare at times, uh, but through it all, I was confident in your ability to get us through. You modeled an extreme growth mindset through the pandemic. You embraced the challenges of pivoting and offering grace, and now you're an HVAC expert, among many other things. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, we know superintendents can't make everyone happy, but you remained focused on doing what's best for our future generation. You showed compassion for each individual in your care. Your leadership decisions were so thoughtful, organized, inclusive, and data-based, and that made our jobs easier. I'm grateful to have had the honor working with you for the last two and a half plus years, which felt like a decade, maybe. And I wish you all the best in your new chapter. Thank you. We got you a parting gift, which is just a small token of our great big appreciation for your steadfast leadership and deep commitment to the Franklin Public Schools over these last five years. <laughs> um Dave Callahan wanted to buy a, a weak, spindly, Chris, um, Charlie Brown Christmas tree type of plant because he knew that you could nurture it and give it the right support. <laughs> it was a metaphor, and I'm like, it's not, I don't think it's going to be as good a presentation, but the story, the story. Yeah, the we Charlie don't... Brown Christmas, it was just so we got that big pole. Right, you're in right. my office and see the plants. It's actually Denise Miller who takes care of it. <laughs> <laughs> I aspire to be a gardener, but... <laughs> It hasn't happened, but um, thank you. I, um, it's been an absolute honor uh, to serve as a superintendent here in Franklin, and it has just felt like uh, the perfect fit. Uh, I remember the phone call uh, from the school committee, and I thought it was just 
um, it was so warm and welcoming and I could hear the cheers in the background uh, when I got hired and it just felt so good to be coming aboard, um, not having been a superintendent and just having the faith um, of the committee at that time in, in my work and um, applying my growth mindset to myself. I am not the same person uh, and the same superintendent and the same leader I was um, when I started. Um, and that is uh, because of your influence and the community's influence on me and, um, and how much I've grown. Um, and it's so bittersweet for me um, and, and so sad for me. And I have felt the comfort version every step of the way um, and I just I mean it's just a tribute and a testament to how um, wonderful and beautiful uh, the people in Franklin are uh, to continue to feel supported um, as I kind of merge my personal and professional life together uh, instead of being uh, separated and, and stretched then um, I want to thank each and every member of the school committees uh, that I have worked with um, you, uh, it is a difficult, sometimes thankless and uh, grossly underpaid. And by that, I mean volunteer job. <laughs> we weathered the pandemic together, but I took a paycheck home every other week. <laughs> um, and you were there um, through thick and thin and um, what have been some really turbulent and very, very difficult times always having my back. Um, Franklin students are in great hands with a very talented set of leaders, um, continuing upon a tremendous foundation. Um, and uh, as, I, as they had been when I arrived, the faculty and staff are uh, incredibly uh, dedicated and committed uh, who are invested in the student outcomes. Um, and over and over and over again, um, our core values um, have, have driven us each and every day social emotional development, a safe and inclusive school culture, high expectations for student success and a collaborative community. And those four core values drove the decisions, drove those, um, some of the commendations that you put in there, uh, you know, were certainly related to the core values. Um, we've weathered quite a storm together. Um, unfortunately, this storm has threatened the fabric of our society and has laid bare injustices, deep wounds, and intense emotions at a time when people are both reactionary and weary. And I would just um, hope that the community reflects on the consensus of the vision of the portrait of a graduate and work together, especially through disagreements towards positive outcomes for each and every child in Franklin. I am your biggest champion and your biggest cheerleader. Um, I'll continue to be happy in celebrating your amazing successes. As one administrator told me when I joined here, uh, frankly, Franklin is a truly special and remarkable place, and indeed it is. And thank you for everything. I'm going to miss it. I miss you. But come visit. The Cape's a great place to <laughs> Just a phone call away. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. That was beautiful. Um, let's move on to Information Matters. Dave O'Neill. McNeil. It's late. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> it's okay. Um, budget subcommittee met last Thursday, June 9th, where we discussed the school meal price increases and revised FY23 budget that were detailed this evening. We do not have another meeting scheduled at this time. Thank you. Policy, Dave C. All right. Um, we just had our meeting uh, the day before. Um, a couple of items, uh, non-discrimination and harassment was up on the agenda, but that's still out with our legal team. It's expected to kind of come back in a few weeks um, where uh, we will plan to meet somewhere in the middle of July. Um, we discussed some of the meal charge uh, policy, but actually the language of the policy itself, kind of bringing it more in line with the updated um, health and wellness from the, the SWAC um, oh, okay. the policy that we kind of passed at our last meeting. We can kind of expect that to come up. Um, over the next couple of meetings as we'll continue to work on that. Um, but uh, kind of the, the bigger point at our last meeting is, as Dr. Hearn had mentioned during her superintendent's report is that we also had a discussion about um, the safety programs, emergency plan, mm -hmm. and also the safety crisis intervention plan. Um, while we did kind of take a look at the policy language itself, 
a lot of it was just to initiate a lot of the conversations from uh, some of the, the really robust conversations that we had throughout uh, that meeting. It led to a lot of the um, topics that Dr. Hearn had brought up, which is great, uh, to really talk about just how intricate uh, all of the plans are that we currently have. You can joke about her being a, an HVAC expert. She also mm -hmm. mentioned about how much she knows about the electrical grids uh, right. in Franklin as well. Um, <laughs> And, you know, because we really do have a comprehensive, a lot of comprehensive plans. We have some great school resource officers, one of which um, Officer Go, who was here uh, throughout much of the meeting in the beginning as well. Um, so Franklin uh, is just doing, uh, you know, really is doing a tremendous job. There's always more work to be done. There's always more reevaluations. We do plan to continue to look at that in future policy meetings. Um, there's also going to be some updates on our website about more information that can be shared. I think Lucas is kind of chomping in the bit if you want to elaborate on. I don't want to. No, okay. yeah, I don't want to um, chomp. But, uh, but yeah, there will be uh, some more updates in the future, um, kind of just pertaining to some of our emergency plans, some of the ways in which uh, family members can reach out, um, kind of reconnect with some students uh, in the event of uh, certain emergencies. Um, but ultimately, I really wanted to kind of uh, bring this up at our policy meetings. We can start a lot of those conversations and also relay a lot of uh, everything to the community, uh, that this is something that uh, central office of this committee as well. Uh, members of admin are continually working on um, the the safety and security of all of our students and all of our buildings. Um, so. Great, thank you. Um, community relations, Camille. Yes, um, we had a meet and greet at Birchwood Bakery on June fourth. Um, there were no visitors. Oh. Um, but we advertised, I think people, you know, it's near the end of the year and we will have another one in September. And also I'm, I'm heartened that at the strawberry stroll, we had quite a number of visitors. Um, our favorites were the um, new families who were new um, with brand new kindergartners and they were excitedly telling them about the school that they would join. Uh, parents appreciated the um, calendars um, that they could put on there. Um, refrigerators and also the QR codes that Lily created so that they could get budget information and also schedules and sign up for the newsletters. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so as Camille had mentioned, the, the calendars were, were a hit. Uh, the parents love that. One suggestion that they'd made was, could we get magnets, calendars that were mm -hmm. just put on the fridge? <laughs> um, so maybe something we consider for um, Harvest Fest. That's a great idea. That's how I keep Track of the path mm -hmm. schedule. It's like a realtor magnet. Exactly. As long as it includes the half day times. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the, just let's keep that in mind. <laughs> Bold. Yeah. Can you just chime in? Just as a, a parent of an incoming kindergartner, the class of 2035, oh my uh, which is crazy, but that, that brochure, um, <laughs> Well, it really was, it was terrific. It provided so much information. Um, it was beautifully presented. And uh, so just as, as a parent, uh, not a school committee member, I uh, wanted to thank you. Uh, that, was, uh, that was great to, to see. And again, just also put class of 2035 was, was rather wild. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we have anything else, Al, on space needs and facilities in the last couple? Half an hour? No. no. Okay, we're good. I, okay. I feel like. <laughs> oh, I got some more bullet points. I kind of held off. You just do it again. Um, okay, joint PCC. Uh, no meetings for the rest of this year. So gotcha. That makes sense. Ball. That makes sense. Okay. Um, substance abuse task force. Any updates? Or do you guys meet in the summer? Um, we don't meet in the summer okay. uh, as a, as a group, but there's some ongoing work that happens throughout the summer where we coordinate and plan and gotcha. meet with the Safe Coalition um, to prep for the next year. Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, DEI committee, we had our last meeting of the school year where we summarized our progress up to this point and discussed a variety of ways to share our work with the school community. The DEI committee will continue this important work next year in collaboration with our new DEI director, Ms. Heidi Harris. Okay. Um, consent agenda. Okay. If you want to hold anything for discussion, let me know. Just say hold. Uh, I recommend approval of the minutes from the May 24th, 2022 school committee meeting agenda as detailed. 
I recommend acceptance of a check for $275 for in-house enrichment as detailed. I recommend acceptance of two checks totaling $974 from the music boosters for in-house enrichment as detailed. I recommend acceptance of a check for $1,600 from the Jefferson, JFK, Parmenter, and Keller PCCs for in-house enrichment as detailed. And I recommend acceptance of a check for $200 from the Parmenter PCC for field trips as detailed. And I recommend acceptance of a check of $285 from BJ's Wholesale Club for district-wide in-house enrichment as detailed. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as detailed? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, the vote will come on the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Citizens comments. Are there any citizens in the audience in person or online who would like to make a comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda and falls within the community's purview, for example, the budget or policies? Yes. Oh, wait, there's a statement I have to read. Give me a second. Um, you're totally welcome to be here. I'm, I, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for speaking up. Okay. In the spirit of open communication, the committee will hold a public participation segment, also called citizen comments, about matters not related to an agenda item within the school committee's purview. Citizens' comments is not a discussion, debate, or dialogue between or among citizens in the school committee. It is intended to offer citizens an opportunity to express their opinions on issues of school committee business. The committee will listen to but not respond to any comment made. If you could state your name, address, and please keep within the three minutes. Steve Sherlock, 10 Lawrence Drive, volunteering as community information director for Franklin Matters, Franklin Public Radio, Franklin TV. Very quickly, a lot has already been said. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Since I'm the only citizen here, last <laughs> Thank you. I'll miss you. I know you do well. Thank you. Lucas, come on. We've got some work to do. <laughs> big shoes to fill there. So. Yeah, bit, yeah. There's a lot of work to do. And to you, community, ex committee, excuse me, because um, you're all volunteers like I am. There's a lot of work ahead of you. Uh, the space needs, the one piece, well, actually, it brings up other questions. We'll get to more of that because you've got the recommendations. They're still going to get digested. Um, restructuring the district, I think, is one piece that will come up as part of that, but it wasn't really mentioned, so just in case. And then I think as you start getting into the timing of that, the school start times may also come back again. So just putting those out there for everybody else to think about, because aside from your two major pieces, hiring a superintendent, and obviously one's going away and one's coming in, the district structure and then coordinating that piece, including the budget, and there is a significant budget impact in terms of how the district operates. You got a lot of work ahead of us. We're here to help. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't see any hands on mine. Okay. Um, new business, Dr. Hearn. Um, so this is my last meeting. Yeah. <laughs> um, the school committee typically meets on the um, second and fourth Tuesdays of the month, there is a meeting scheduled for June 28th, but I think the agenda is TBD, mm -hmm. not quite sure um, the direction of that. Right. Um, and then we'll we have that out. meeting in July and where you typically set up your presentation schedule for the year. Yeah, that's a good reminder at the first meeting in July. Okay, great. Um, I was wondering if maybe at the June the next meeting, we could have a personnel update just as far as like where we are with hiring and open positions and admin and central office and the whole bit that I think would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, finally, we will be adjourning to executive session and will not be returning to open meeting. Pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the FEA RN unit as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the school committee. And the chair so declares. Pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A2, to discuss strategy in preparation for negotiations with non union personnel. Is there a motion to adjourn to executive discussion as discussed? 
So moved. Is there a second? Second. But we'll come on the motion. We need to do a roll call vote. Um, Dave Callahan. Yes. Took me a minute. Al Charles. Aye. Yes. Dave McGill. Yes. 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 Yes.